I want to thank everybody uh, for coming, and I really, really appreciate a good crowd. I want to make one announcement, and then we're going to open the conference with a prayer, but just one administrative, so you know, we have rooms 107, 108, 109, 110, 111, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11 are overflow rooms. So if some of you want to go into those rooms, they have big screens, and also there will be a lot more people that are attending that are in those rooms. So you should be very, very proud that not only do we have a good group in here, we have that many overflow rooms with people watching. Now, I would like to introduce our uh, opening prayer, Father James Farfarlia, Our Lady of Guadalupe Catholic Church. Father James and I have been visiting outside, and I, he's, I've met a very good friend, and we're very, very glad to have him. Father, thanks for being here today, and I will turn this over to you for the opening prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day, and we also thank you for this opportunity to come together to discuss, to listen, and to think about a very serious problem, perhaps a problem that we're not really too aware of that's happening here, even locally. And Heavenly Father, as we begin our discussions and our, our time together today, we want to thank you for the gift of life, the life that begins at the moment of conception in the womb of a mother. We thank you for the gift of life that ends by natural death. Heavenly Father, we live in a time in a culture which is against life. We live in a culture of death all throughout the world. And many times we are filled with fear and with anxiety with all the things and challenges that are happening in our world today. Sometimes we feel small, useless, and wonder, well, what can I do? But you have called us together here today to try and do something. I guess it goes back to the old saying that is it better to light one candle or to curse the darkness. So we want to light that one candle, each one of us trying to do what we can do. So as we pray together, Heavenly Father, Fill us with your spirit so that we may be wise in making prudent decisions. Fill us with the fortitude that we need to have the courage to take a stand. And fill us with the hope that we need to always be convinced of your final victory over evil. And we ask this in the name of Jesus the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Thank you very much, Father. And again, I appreciate everybody being here. We have some information that uh, we'll be putting on the big screen. If you are in social media and you're into tweeting, we really push you on the tweeting. And why do I push this? Because, ladies and gentlemen, this is a serious issue that needs to be attention and educated to the whole area. And sometimes we have to create our own media so that we can provide this information to the people who care, who need help. But the key thing is to educate folks on that we're dealing with a real issue, a real issue. The other thing I want to tell you a little bit is that we're not stopping today. This isn't just a getting a group together. This is getting a group together with meat, substance, and then I'm going to conclude today's conference telling you how we're going to proceed forward. Throughout the day, I will introduce various people and the sponsors, and I will basically do that intermittently because I want you to know some of the people that are here. Let me give you some more administrative. I've told you about the overflow rooms, and again, you in here can attend in those, and there will be other people in the other rooms. Secondly, we do have continuing education for many of the groups. 
If you are interested in continuing education, the forums are on the tables out front. If you need any help, please grab me throughout the day. Uh, let me tell you some of my staff folks that are in here. Uh, Angie Flores, our coordinator of the conference, raise your hand in the back. That's Angie. And then in the back, Charlotte, raise your hand. Mario, raise your hand. And Dan, raise your hand. And, I, and in, in the out front, I have Jennifer and Gay as well. So just please grab them on anything that you need. Lunch will be at 12. Uh, we will go outside and you'll bring your lunch inside or go into the rooms. And then we're going to keep the schedule pretty much uh, moving forward. Each of the panels will conduct the panels the way they want. Some may open for questions, some may not. I'm leaving it to them. This is a free flow. We have a moderator per panel and we have panelists. And they all have been preparing for several, several months. So I want you to know, thank you all for being here today. Now, I want to tell you a few things about who's here. First, Senator Juan Hinojosa's office here. Sylvia, raise your hand. Thank you. And I know I saw uh, Judge Brent Chesney in the back. Now, Judge Chesney, as you know, is the judge over the county court at Law 5, and that is the juvenile court, and deals with a lot of issues that are similar to what we're dealing with. And I think that uh, Judge Chesney told me he'll be here till approximately 10:30, 11. He has a funeral he has at 10. But if you have some questions, I ask him to stay here part. So if you have some issues that you may want to talk about this subject we have his ear here today. So I want you to know that. And then I did see uh, Councilwoman Lillian Riojas. Where are you, Lillian? Raise your hand. And there will be some other public officials. I know District Attorney Mark Skirk is here. Where's Mark? Right over here. And don't worry, I know there's some other public officials, but I'm spreading you through the program so that everybody knows. I'm going to make a little political comment. I had some of you come up to me, and I'm going to make some comments when I end the program on why I'm interested in this topic. But here's my political comment. When you go into the next election cycle, this next year, the year after, the following year, if you're really passionate about this subject, Find out what public officials are attending and doing something about it. We can all talk, as Jim and Martha know, but it's time to act. And on this topic, it's time to act. And so encourage your public officials to attend these sort of conferences. Encourage them to get engaged because I want you to know this topic is, means a lot to me. And that's how I'm going to conclude the program, on why, and then where we're going to go. But that's my only political comment to you for right now. And I will be introducing various uh, folks throughout the day. We still have some other public officials, and we also have some church leaders as well as business leaders that I want you to know here. Enough said. The good thing about me is I don't talk too long. I'm... I'm I'm as good as Pastor David is on keeping my sermon on time. <laughs> and Pastor David, I just want you to know that is coffee waves coffee out in the front, see. <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to start with our first panel. The first panel is what is human trafficking, the victim services, and the medical? And I'm going to ask that each of the panelists tell you about themselves. But let me tell you who is on the panel. We have Menta Moore, Executive Director of New Life Ministries. Menta has been 
doing a great job working with me over the last few years. Uh, and in fact, we just had a run to bring awareness, a run and walk to bring awareness, as well as a fundraiser to help fight human trafficking. We also, and she is basically our moderator for this panel. We have Dennis Mark, Chairman, Executive Director of Redeem Ministries. Dennis has been working with us and is passionate about this topic. And then Sonia Edelman, who I've worked with in our last programs as well as the current programs with Driscoll Children's Hospital. This panel will go till approximately 10 a.m. I'll come in if uh, we're still flowing just to kind of give you the soft stop button is how we'll do it. <laughs> then we'll bring the hooks out when we need it, Lucy, is what we'll do. But anyway, thank you all again. I'm going to turn it over to panel one. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for all you've done. And you'll probably have to push those buttons to make it go green on the microphones, I think, just to talk. Thank you all very much. And again, I'll be in the back if anybody needs me for anything. <clears throat> Good morning. It's the colors red, not green. <laughs> well, my name is Minta Moore, and uh, I'm with New Life Refuge Ministries. And just, I, I thought you all would have bios, so I'm just going to tell you what we're doing really quickly in a nutshell. We are working to build a long term care home for minor victims of trafficking. We have an information table if you want to know more about that. So, um, it's, on, it's an honor to be here. I thank you all very much for coming. Um, so I am going to moderate this session. Dennis Mark sits here to my left, and he is with Redeemed Ministries out of Houston. They currently operate a safe home for adult women who are uh, coming out of sex trafficking or the sexual exploitation industry. Um, so I'm going to let him kick it off with some facts uh, on human trafficking. But before we do that, can I have a show of hands as to your general knowledge of the issue of trafficking? Who has a, a fairly good working base knowledge of human trafficking? Okay, maybe half. Okay, very good. All right, well, thank you. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dennis. Good morning, everyone. You know, I'm always excited about the, the aspect of, uh, of doing these symposiums, these seminars, when I see a community come together because of our work. And, and my name is Dennis Mark. I am the Chairman and Executive Director of Redeem Ministries. I have been in this fight for seven and a half years. Uh, and if you'll notice the bags under my eyes, they're earned. Um, and for those of you who know me in the audience, you'll know why those bags are there. Uh, I don't ever sleep, it seems like, uh, because of this issue. And so I'm encouraged by the fact that all of you are here today because um, we each are on our own journey in this fight and we're at our own point of where we are going to make a decision of where we're going to continue on. And the more we know, the more we are educated, the more we are aware, the more we can become engaged. And those two have to be related to one another. Awareness is only awareness in, unless you put engagement with it, then it becomes powerful. And so that's the important aspect. So we're going to go briefly through this uh, information about human trafficking. And I, we actually discussed whether or not we were going to put the legal ease up there, but I wanted to think, simplify what this is and uh, what human trafficking looks like. And because of the very term trafficking, many people have confusion about what this is. Trafficking has nothing to do with smuggling people across borders. It is the absolute exploitation of human beings for the purpose of a profit. It's turning a human being into a commodity. Traffickers do not wake up in the morning deciding how bad can I abuse a person. They wake up in the morning, how much money can I make today? And so until we have the same resolve to fight this issue, then we're going to always be behind, behind the curve. And so these are the very simplified definitions and there's three words that you must come to understand and know and that is the terms force fraud and coercion those three elements are 
clearly defined in the Trafficking Victims Protection Act. If you want to identify a victim, one of those three things must exist. Or, in the case of a minor, those things don't need to, are not required to exist because the simple act of a minor being engaged in the Commercial Sex Act, it automatically makes them a victim. And so it is very important that we understand that. And we can understand force and we can understand fraud. I don't have to go into the details of that. The one that stumbles us the most is the coercion piece. And we're going to talk more about that later and how that operates and how that works and why that's so difficult to understand. Because that is the backbone of why it is so difficult to provide services to victims. Because many of the women out there don't know their victims. And so again, we're going to look at that a little bit later. Um, these are again are the five types of trafficking that have been recognized by the United Nations, by the United States, and by other countries around the world. And um, the, little is known about three of these types of trafficking. Primarily what we look at is labor and sex, but there is child trafficking, and typically that is forced child labor that happens in India, uh, happens in third world countries. You have f forced child soldiering, uh, as exemplified in northern Uganda under the Lord's Resistance Army, under Joseph Tony. I spent time in Uganda documenting cases of child soldiering in 2009, some of the victims that were there. And so uh, this is kind of a little known thing that we have to deal with here in the United States. Although we're coming across it now where you have children who are being forced to sell magazines door to door. And, uh, and so now we're starting to see some ramifications of that going on in our communities. The other two, bride trafficking and organ trafficking, again, are something that we don't really deal with too much. And the big confusion about bride trafficking, bride trafficking is not mail order brides. Bride trafficking is when a trafficker pays somebody to marry somebody to bring them into the country and then deliver them to traffickers, either for the purpose of labor exploitation or sex exploitation. A common case of that was in South Korea, 20 U.S. service members were convicted of sex trafficking when they were marrying Korean nationals, transporting them to the United States, divorcing them, and then turning them over to, to, to the traffickers. And so that's what bride trafficking looks like. And of course, the last one on the list is sex trafficking. The real misunderstanding is the fact that labor trafficking probably is more prevalent in the United States than we realize, but sex trafficking is most exposed because of the sheer advertisement value of what sex can bring to this market. And so again, so that's the veil that is hard to pull back and hard to see. But if there are labor services going on where there is uh, agricultural, uh, domestic services, maids, yard workers, construction, anything that's service related typically has the potential of having a labor trafficking victim there. So again, those are the five types of trafficking. Um, these are the numbers. Now this is very important for you to remember again, these are estimated numbers because people count differently when they're looking at victimology, what is out there, what is going on in communities around the world, and so these numbers vary. That's why I have a 21 to 30 million slaves in the world today. Many people would say that that's very, very conservative. In, the, in India alone, the Dalit, the cast, the Dalit caste is basically a slave caste. And there are 25 million of them in that caste alone. Right? And 14 million of them are women. So again, so that kind of skews the number. So again, when you're looking at this from either the United Nations Office of Drug and Crime, the International Office of Migration, the International Labor Organization, the U.S. State Department, whoever, when they're looking at this issue, it becomes very difficult to count numbers because the major factor, again, is victims don't know they're victims, especially in labor trafficking because it is a generational process for them, and so they are passing along their slavery to their children and their grandchildren, and it's just a way of life, and so you can't count slavery that way. So again, so these are some of the basic numbers. Most of you have seen them. Uh, you'll also notice that the variance there on the 200,000 to 600,000 slaves in the United States, again, is a process of the fact that victims don't know they're victims. And so that becomes very difficult uh, to understand. In fact, the women who come into our program, uh, we have housed 20, uh, now 24 women in our house in the last three years. Um, doesn't sound like a lot of numbers, but that's with only four beds in our house. Uh, we have about a 40% success rate because of the relapse rate of women going back to sex trafficking because, again, of the neurobiology of trauma that has affected their brain 
their brain is broken and so it's very difficult and so again these numbers that we see are very difficult to count because again of, the, of that aspect <clears throat> this is a um, the type of trafficking that relates to sex trafficking and the key word here is forced and again when we talk about force that also includes the as aspect of force the fraud and the coercion because if I was to ask any of the women in this room if you woke up tomorrow wanting to be a prostitute would that be true doubtful no woman wakes up in the morning wanting to go through the amount of sheer nauseating trauma that they experience uh, in, in a day just in a day and so we have a woman right now who's in our house um, She's 34 years old, so you're going to do some math real quick. She's 34 years old, and her first engagement in the Commercial Sex Act was four years old. 30 years, she's been in trauma, okay? And so you can imagine what that will do to the brain. And so, again, when we look at these issues, it is all about the forcing of an individual to be a commodity for the purpose of exploitation to gain a profit. And so, again, it's very important that we understand these aspects. and. You'll also notice that there's a term up there, forced pornography. That's something that's coming to light now that we understand. A case, uh, a case a year ago in Austin, it's still an active investigation, so I can't talk a, lot, talk a lot about it, but there was a woman that was rescued from there who was in forced pornography, and it was very, very violent. And so again, that's part of the stuff that we're seeing. So the more we talk about the issue of pornography, the better it is because that will be a contributing factor to a lot of the stuff of what we're dealing with in the long term. So again, let's start talking openly about the dangers of pornography, uh, talking to men, educating men to the reality of this because these factors all come into play when it comes to the exploitation of women. Um, also these are some of the, um, the factors relating to the victimology of the, of the children. And again, you'll notice one of those points there is the traumatization, the victimization starts at a very early age. And what we're finding too now in our programs that we're dealing with the women now is that we're not dealing with actually with a trauma of the sex trafficking that happened a month ago or even a year ago. What we're finding is we're dealing with trauma that happened seven to 12 years prior. So typically that's the child who was first molested by a parent or a friend or whoever. And so that's what we're dealing with. So what comes of that is seven to 12 years from now, we're gonna be dealing with the trauma that they're dealing with right now from the exploitation. So again, you have to realize that this is not a short-lived experience of providing care. So the victimization of starting early is very, very important to understand because that is really where the brain gets broken and starts down the path of all this trauma that goes on in their life. Um, and then also the fact that, our, the sheer fact of our runaways that are in our, that's really plaguing our nation right now, uh, that, you know, in reality of coming to understand that children are not running to something, they're running from something. And when you're broken, then you go to brokenness. And so that's what you're looking for. You're looking for something that will fulfill something that's missing in your life. The other aspect of that, when we talk about the demand side, is the same factor, is what we're seeing a lot of times in the buyers of sex have been traumatized as children as well. And so we have to start looking at this differently as well, that it's not purely an instance of just deviant people, but we're looking at people who have been severely traumatized as children. And I think the numbers now are running around one in five children are sexually abused as children, one in 20 boys are uh, abused as children. And so we're starting to see those numbers actually change some. <clears throat> If you want to know who's vulnerable to this, here is a very, very short list of the people out there who are vulnerable. Uh, I do this presentation, I talk about this with uh, school districts, and I talk to bus drivers and counselors and teachers and administrators, and, and I challenge them to look at this list and think of people that they know that they see every day that matches a, one of those items on the list, and everybody knows somebody that has experienced one of these things in their life um, and that's real danger and, and again as we see the continued breakdown of the family these things are just what grows this 
and this is where we have to really be identifying these in our public school systems, being educating our children. This is where the church has to get involved. Faith communities have to be involved about educating families and kids about the real dangers out there because any one of these factors is a vulnerability that can be exploited by a trafficker because whatever they're not getting at home, somebody out there will provide to them. And so again, these are the things that will generate the possibility of exploitation. I'm sorry I have to keep turning around because I want to make sure I'm where I'm at on this. Um, why? And here again is the supply and demand issues of this. Um, the main number one reason why this exists is demand. Demand. There would not be exploitation if there was not a demand for sex or cheap labor. And so until we start addressing equally the problem of supply and demand, we're always going to be fighting this issue. We have to change the perceptions of how women are viewed. The number one way that we're going to do that is we're going to have to start challenging the way media portrays women. It really is going to become that because what we are doing is we are communicating two messages to the society out there. One, that this is a very bad thing and you know, we shouldn't be not, should not be exploiting women and then turn around and sell tacos with a woman in a bikini. Those two things are not going to work together side by side. And until communities start raising up their voice to fight this, we're always going to be fighting this. And so again, it's very, very important that that's an aspect of what we do. And, and the way we do that now is the young boys out there who are fourth, fifth, and sixth grade need to be talked to about this issue. We have to pull back, you know, on this and say, you know what? Yes, it's a tough subject, but it has. To, we have to be honest about it. Because if we're not going to be honest, they're going to be lied to. And the more they're lied to, the more they're going to believe that, and the more they're, we're going to grow up the next generation of buyers out there. So again, these are the facts of what we're looking at from a supply and demand issue. Until we really tackle those issues, again, this is going to be something that's going to be on our radar for a long time. Hmm? Okay. Um, again, this more why factors of why this is happening. You know, we understand these things as well. And what this brings to us is a reality that we have to look at. The life, the game, the sex industry is not glamorous. Even though the media portrays that to us, it is not glamorous. This are, these are three women, only three women, who are, have been booked into a county jail somewhere who were arrested for prostitution. We don't know the time period that each photograph was taken, but you can see the transformation that occurs on these women that are in the life or in the game. And I would almost say the bottom one is not a woman. I would say that she's probably a minor. <laughs> you know, and so this is, this is the face of what we are dealing with. And so you can see the level of what, of what exploitation does to a, a woman. So again, this is the reality of it. Um, these are signs of how to identify victims. Again, this is a very short list. Um, and this is something that's very important for, for law enforcement to realize because the verbiage that is used a lot of times when law enforcement contacts a woman, uh, speaking of a boyfriend, typically probably not a boyfriend, especially if that boyfriend is holding an ID. If she does not have her own identification, then there's a good chance that she probably is a victim. Branding, branding is a very real way of identifying a victim. I've actually seen a group of women one time who all had the exact same tattoo on their neck. And so that again is a, a very real aspect of this. And I think uh, we'll go ahead and talk about that in a moment. So, All right, thank you, Dennis. Um, Sonia Edelman is over here and she is uh, a sane nurse. I wish we were all sane. <laughs> but that's, a, that's an acronym for a sexual assault nurse examiner. examiner. And so her, she has some amazing knowledge um, and has seen probably some pretty horrific things. But she's going to be telling us about the medical response to trafficking. Sonia? Given that introduction by Minta, know that I'm not getting ready to show you it up there. Um, because Representative Hunter wants y'all to stay all day. So we're not going to show pictures this morning. Um, I am fortunate to direct the care team at Driscoll Children's Hospital, which is the child abuse resource and evaluation team. 
um, and we evaluate children that are suspected victims of physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, torture, starvation, um, anything that shouldn't happen to children. That's what we evaluate them for. Um, we also have a team of forensic nurse examiners that um, take care of all the adult sexual assault victims in this area, and we examine them at Doctors Regional Medical Center. So um, from babies to the elderly, um, our team takes care of them. So my um, part in this puzzle, and if you're here, you have a part in this puzzle too. Um, hopefully the jigsaw puzzle is going to get many, many more pieces today to fit together. Um, but my part is limited to the medical component of that. So when we see, um, and I'm going to talk specifically about sexual abuse, but know that a lot of times for the trafficking victims, there's also a physical abuse and a physical assault, um, because many times that beating them down actually keeps them there um, because they have a fear component in there. But our team um, doesn't have to solicit people to come. So um, if you are a non-government entity and you're um, trying to find a way to support these victims, you may think, how are we going to get in touch with those victims? Like, how, how am I going to find them and how am I going to get them to me? Um, that is not the issue for the medical team. We see about 2,000 children a year. Um, I would tell you it's difficult to um, identify, much as Dennis already said, like all of the ones that are trafficked. Um, we have several that we know are trafficked. They're brought in by Border Patrol or the FBI or um, somebody like that. That's pretty darn clear when they come in. But we also see a tremendous amount of runaways, and the people that they have run away with are um, boyfriends for a day is what we call them um, because they're not their boyfriend. Um, you know, they may be 15 years older than them. They may be 20 years older than them. Um, for our adults, they really thought they were a passage from one place to another, but then they became their captor instead, not just a passage. So the medical team um, provides, like we would for anyone else, a complete medical forensic examination. And if you haven't been exposed to that, um, and I hope you haven't, that would be great, um, that consists of us taking a medical history from them about exactly what has happened to them. A very detailed history like you would give to your medical provider um, with incredibly sensitive words. Um, their words are very, very powerful. Um, they are not always what we would call medical words. Um, they're words that would be in the pornography video or would be in the magazine or somebody would say to you if they were trying to degrade you. But it's important for their words to be heard. Um, we do that in order to be able to treat those patients, but there's a secondary benefit to having that medical history, and that ends up in the courtroom. Um, many times in the courtroom, and there's attorneys in the room, so I'm going to slaughter this law here right in front of them, but this is the medical version of the law. Um, uh, the law does um, not, the court does not permit gossip in the courtroom. They want to hear straight from the person who has the story to tell. But there are some exceptions to the gossip rule. They call it the hearsay rule. And one of them is if you give information to your medical provider in order for them to take care of you, then they can give that information again. So when the victims come to court and maybe they are able to do a great job on the stand, maybe they're not. Maybe that is too difficult of a situation. We also have the information that they gave us in order to take care of them that day. Um, and for little children um, that have like four word phrases um, all the way to our adults that can speak and speak and speak, having someone else speak that's not the injured party is really impactful for them. Um, but then we do a complete head to toe examination. So we're looking for any kind of injuries they have any kind of markings that have been placed on them. Um, Dennis touched on this, but sometimes there's temporary tattooing with some Sharpie markers. Um, we had some just last month that had a high Hitler sign on them, and there's four of them. They all had the si same sign, same place with a Sharpie marker. 
a really good Sharpie marker because it was not coming off even though we tried. Um, but many of them also have permanent tattoos. And um, they think it's really like wearing one of these, um, but it's just so nobody sees it. But how cool is it? Like my boyfriend gave me this mark. So like he, I belong to him and he belongs to me. And they really don't have the perception that they have been branded like cattle. And they're getting ready to be sold like cattle or traded like cattle. Um, we also do a detailed genital examination because many of them have had some kind of penetration um, either in their mouth or in their anus or in their female sexual organ and now Todd's in the back and I've said my words right there in front of everybody but those were the clean version of the words I'll just tell you. Um, um, but being able to collect that evidence as we go along many times can help law enforcement and help prosecution um, in locking up those people because many times the trafficking victims do not know the people's name. Sometimes they can barely give a description because they've been through, through such a traumatic experience that they know it was four guys or it was, it was five guys and there was this lady there. Well, I think she was a lady because they're just like being the head boss and they're not really sure was it a lady or was it not a lady. Um, and then we're able to give them medications that can protect them against sexually transmitted diseases like gonorrhea and chlamydia and trichomonas. Um, we also vaccinate for hepatitis. Um, we can give a vaccination for the human papillomavirus or HPV and we can give um, a medication for emergency contraception when there's a concern of pregnancy. Um, what we can't do is protect them against HIV. Um, there are medications that we can give that you may hear, I hope you hear more and more on the news about um, what we call post-exposure HIV medications, which means if we see you within 48 hours of the time it happened, we can give medications that really can almost prevent you from becoming positive for AIDS or even contacting the HIV virus. The um, challenges in that is that they have to come quick, and that doesn't always happen. Many times this trafficking has been a long, long journey, a long time period. Um, and so that may not be available. But um, one of the other challenges that we face after providing this care for them is the follow-up care that needs to happen for them. And part of that is medical follow-up care. If they're going to start the HIV medicine, they need to be able to take it every day for 28 days. And it costs about $1,700. So can you imagine sitting there today no matter what you think about our new health care, just shell out 1700 on the table. Um, that would go great towards this cause, right, if we all had that money to, to put forward. So you can imagine being a victim of trafficking, and now here's the money that you need for HIV prophylaxis. Um, but you also have to be able to take it every single day. Um, and as you're going to hear a little bit from Dennis and um, Minta, but also throughout the day, the aftercare or the follow-up care is one of the biggest challenges that we have for these people. Um, and not having them shuffled from place to place and having a um, good, secure location where they feel safe, somebody that can continue getting their medical care for them, getting them mental health um, therapy is, is a huge challenge. Um, but I will say, even though we treat children and adults, the biggest challenge we see medically is adults believing what's happened. Because we just, sitting there today, unless you've been a victim of human trafficking, um, you just don't know. And you can't look at somebody like the mug shots, they do look impressive. Um, but if you pass that person in HEB last night when you went to get groceries, you passed them. You didn't say, oh my gosh, that's a victim of human trafficking, I need to do something. You looked at him at the light this morning, didn't say anything. The, the, the trafficker was taking them to work wherever they were dropping them off and we didn't take an action. Um, and especially when it's adults, we think they made choices. They didn't make those choices. And when they're children, we don't believe them because we think children lie. Um, we hear that every day. You know children lie. And let me, let me just tell you, 
they lie less than adults do because adults have figured it out, right? They're called white lies or soft lies or lies for a good reason. Um, so when somebody gives us that information, no matter what your role is here, I mean, we have to be willing to take that on and to believe them. Um, we're not the judge. Y'all may be a jury someday. I never get to be on the jury, but um, you may serve on a jury, and if you do, that would be an incredible role for you to support what they have said out loud. Um, and I just appreciate y'all being here today, having this much interest. Human trafficking is not brand new. Um, it may be new to you, like, you know, Representative Hunter is doing this thing because there's this trafficking that just started up and, and we've, we've got to take care of it. It is not new. Um, it has a name to it now, which is incredible. It's kind of like when we figured out what cancer was. Then you figured out, you know, a lot of my relatives have died of that stuff. How about that? We don't want that to happen to human trafficking victims. Now that it's been identified, we know it's been going on and on and on. Um, we need to take the time to address it. Thank you very much, Sonia. Well, as we move into the next section, we're going to talk a little bit about aftercare. And the most important thing um, where aftercare starts is the need for the victims to have a safe place to go, food and shelter. That almost sounds like a no-brainer. But until they feel safe, they are not going to be no. They're not, Safety is our the most is the utmost because I mean no one wants to move forward with anything until they feel safe, and since they are a commodity to someone, and when they leave somebody is losing money. Safety is a very important thing. So they a safe place is uh, like I said um, of the utmost importance. Um, Dennis is uh, going to talk to us a little bit here in just a second about some services. Uh, it's important um, for members, members of the criminal justice system and service providers to work together for victims to feel secure and knowing that everyone involved is looking out for them, for their safety. Unfortunately, survivors who um, will often suffer a wide variety of uh, mental issues, the trauma uh, that Dennis is going to share a little bit more about um, makes it, uh, a, them a difficult population to serve. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over back over to Dennis. Thank you, Manta. This, uh, this slide here is kind of the, uh, I like to say the first step to effective aftercare because these four components must exist in a community. Must. Not could or maybe, but have to. And, and it, it really is a requirement for all the community to come to, to come to understand these four components because they are the foundation. And so the first one is awareness. Again, like what we're doing here today, awareness. And it's education because, again, if you go out and try to talk about the subject half educated, then you're going to get half a response. And so again, having the proper information, having the the right information, having all that 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 um, all the all the the tools that you need to put in place are going to come from the community. And I say that's important because the the next step is prosecution, which is law enforcement's role. And here is one of the major struggles that we've seen in the past is that first of all, law enforcement doesn't trust non, non, most non-GOs, NGOs, non-profits, you know, and the community, because they work in a different world. How many of you have ever done, uh, gone on a civilian ride along with law enforcement? Good. If you're involved in this fight, you need to go ride with the police. You need to see what the street looks like after 10 p.m., because it is a different world, and they deal in a different world. and so. The aspect of what we think is important kind of changes. Our paradigm shifts when we see that new reality to us. And so here's what's happened in the past, especially when it comes to law enforcement, is law enforcement gets blamed for this because they're not doing enough. But they're also the ones who get blamed for doing something about it because the reality that most people live under is that this is not that big of a deal. The one term that we always hear is, this is a victimless crime. 
You have two consenting adults exchanging money for sex. What's the big deal? When you have aggravated armed robberies, aggravated sexual assaults, you have uh, violent home invasions going on, why isn't law enforcement doing, concentrating on that rather than this? Because this is not that important. And again, until we raise the awareness level what, how exploitive this is and how traumatizing this is to the people, then we begin to realize that this is important. Because when law enforcement gets blamed for this, I always tell law enforcement, you need to ask the community, what are you doing? Why is it just my responsibility? The whole community should be come together because when it becomes a priority for the community, it becomes a priority for law enforcement. Those two elements have to work together. And so this is the way that collaborative efforts work. And so again, prosecution uh, is very important. And the, the realization too is that it is the role of law enforcement to do direct rescues. And so this should shut out any of the vigilantes out there that think that you can just drag a woman out of a brothel or off the street and get her help because there is a process to this and you can do more damage taking somebody out of a situation uh, to their case for law enforcement to actually prosecute a case because again you're destroying evidence of their duress and all the stuff that really are the elements to trafficking case and so again that's a very important aspect to this. The next portion of it is um, protection. This is the services. This is the, the huge piece. This is the huge piece because of the necessary resources that it's going to take to actually provide care to survivors. Okay, that's, that's the, the big elephant in the room that pushes its way around and gets, it gets where it wants to go because there's so much involved in that. And the part of that process is the fact that you have to understand what the needs are for that woman because there was a study that was done a few years ago. They were doing a study on a 14-year-old juvenile rescued from sex trafficking and the reason it was only 14 months is because she relapsed after 14 months but in that time period for every piece of care that she received they calculated a cost associated with that and in 14 months it was five hundred and forty thousand dollars one victim okay and so again that's the reality that we look at the the, the size of care is enormous and the the other part of that is the size of commitment from the organizations, the community, from law enforcement, everybody working together is also huge. You know, I, I tell people you can be passionate about that, and that's great, but I guarantee you your passion will burn out in six months if you're not prepared for the long haul of this. It is a calling on your life. If you're going to do this work, it has to be a commitment from the now until the time you take your last breath. And the reason is not just because it's that hard, it's because that's what the women need. Because if you are only going to do this for a short period of time and quit on them, you've done, done a lot more damage than you've done in a trafficking situation because you've just become another rank and file person who has let them down. And so I'm, I'm, when I, my new volunteers, I do everything that I can to run my volunteers off. And I tell them, unless you're annoying me, I'm not going to let you work with us. And so that's the reality. I want people who are really committed to this because the reality is it's the 1% rule. For every 100 people who hear about this subject, one person will make a commitment to this. One person. And so again, that's a big part of that part. Can I interject something? Yes, please. So you may kind of think, why on earth do we want to help them? Because it's, uh, it's so enormous. One victim, a half a million dollars in 14 months. But what comes to mind for me, this is the fastest growing crime worldwide. It comes in only second behind drug dealing. And so we're looking at this problem only getting larger. And if we don't start helping the, the, the people get out and find way, better lives, it's going to overtake us. The last piece of this is um, partnerships, collaboration. That is absolutely essential. No one organization can do this work. No one organization has the ability or the resources needed to really tackle this issue, especially when it comes to aftercare. And it's not until we get, we have to take our pride off and throw it in the trash and get rid of that because it's not about us, it's about them. And you know, it, there's, I know there's limited funding out there for NGOs and nonprofits to fight for, but that doesn't matter. You know, the, the big key thing that I educate communities on is find your silo 
of influence and work in that silo. And that way you can find your partnerships a lot better and easier to work with. Because it really is about, there's this old saying that Dave Batson from Not For Sale used to say is, it's, uh, we live in a society of coopetition. <laughs> okay, and you know, one person on one side of town wakes up and says, I'm gonna fight human trafficking today. And then somebody on the other side of town goes, I'm gonna fight human trafficking. And you end up fighting each other rather than fighting human trafficking. Because again, you're not understanding what that silo that you can provide because everybody has a skill set and it's very important to identify those. So those are the four elements that have to work together in a collaborative effort to fight this issue. Um, again, understanding where they are. Again, that's what I talked about going out and riding with law enforcement. It's very critical that you're able to see that. Uh, I just was in Victoria, Texas uh, a few weeks ago, right after the raid that they did there and in Rockport and in Houston. And I, I had been invited to come down for an event and I ended up riding around all night with a law enforcement officer and seeing it. And what was funny is we were going down the street and saw this, there was this Walgreens and there's this woman talking to a guy in a car and I was eyeballing her and looking at her and the officer says, you see something? I said, yeah, I, I, that, that, that girl's in the life. And he goes, no, she's just talking. I said, she's in the life. So we drove down, went down a little ways further. About 10, 15 minutes later, a call drops on the radio. Uh, yeah, the manager of Walgreens has called and said there's a couple having sex in the parking lot. I'm like, hmm. He goes, wow, you nailed it. I'm like, so again, understanding what you're seeing out there is very critical. You have to understand their life. You have to understand that life out there. You have to understand the verbiage. You know, we talk about the words. You spoke I earlier. Didn't say the words. You didn't say the words. <laughs> And, you know, if my wife was here, she would probably say words that would make everybody blush in the room because she's very good about that. But you have, to be, you have to be comfortable with that. You have to be comfortable where they are because that bridges that trust relationship and the gap that they need so desperately to heal. They need to know that you're not going to flinch when you say bad, they say bad, ugly words. They need to know that they can trust you, that this is, this is where I am and this is who I am and this is what I've done. And, because that overcomes the shame and the guilt that they bring, into the, bring to the table. And so again, these are the aspects you have to understand where they are. And so go out and see it. Go out, I encourage you to go out and see it. Um, four basic needs. Minty, you wanna talk about that real quick? I know this is, or you want me to cover it? Well, we, we, yeah. we kinda talk, well, you know, we kinda talked about that, you know, shelter, food, clothing, medical care, those are gonna be the first basic needs that will need to be met. Uh, just with any human being we all need those and then until that those the needs are met um, it's really hard for them to move forward in the recovery process yeah and the real difficulty in this is this is exactly what the pimp does mm -hmm. this is what the pimp does he does these four basic needs mm -hmm. so we have to do it better than the pimp <laughs> or we're, we're competing with the pimp and the pimp will usually win because again there's a lot more Benefits. Trauma bonds, the trauma yeah, bonds. Yeah, the trauma and bond, the benefit in their mind is that it's easier because one of the things that they get to do while they're in the life is medicate themselves. And the medication is a process of how they don't deal with the trauma that's going on in their brain. So again, we'll talk more about that in a moment. So that's critical. Um, and this is something I harp on a lot. When we talk about this situa issue of rescue, um, Rescue is not simply removing a person from an exploitative situation. Not removing them from their exploitation or a bad situation. That's not rescue. Rescue is dealing with from the time that that young woman or that young boy was first traumatized by a family member to the time that they get healed, which may be a long time. I think the average is right now 10, two to 20 years depending on the level of trauma. Okay, so that's, that's the rescue. It is multiple things that have to happen in, in, in this long journey of healing before rescue really works. And the other part of the difficulty of that is, what is successful? What is, how do you measure success in this situation? Because success looks differently from each one of the women. You know, and that's something, as an aftercare provider, we struggle with is, what does that look like? For us, it simply means that she is not being exploited in the commercial sex industry. Now, she may be doing things that we don't agree with, but she's still not in the commercial sex industry. That's our priority. We do not want her to be exploited by somebody in 
it's in the life, in the game. And so again, that's how we measure success. But that becomes a difficulty in this process is how do you measure success? And, and so that's where we come from in this, this piece of it. And again, the collaboration effort is very important. This uh, it requires a multidisciplinary team. And one of the struggles that's been in the past is faith-based organizations working with psychologists. And that, that struggle of, you know, the technical terms associated with mental disorders and things like that. And the faith community is saying, well, you know, we can lay hands on them and heal them. I don't doubt that. But again, there are so many factors to how the brain is broken that we need to be aware of so we know what to pray for. You know, that's, that's critical. And so these are the things that are very, very important to understand. Now, this is the, the hard part. And this is helping us understand this issue. And I want to give you a name that you're going to, I want you to Google, okay? Um, and she's done some remarkable work. She's out of uh, the University of Michigan. Her name is Dr. Rebecca uh, Campbell. Um, phenomenal woman. She's done some, some neurobiology of, of um, sexual assault, which basically is this neurobiology of trauma. Uh, there is the National Institute of Justice. There's a great presentation there. Her presentation's on that. So you can do a search for neurobiology of sexual assault, Dr. Rebecca Campbell and you'll find this information. It's more elaborate than what I can go through in like, nothing. Not, min, like one minute. <laughs> so here's a simple fact. I'll tell you this real quick. You're going down the road on a bicycle. You hit a bump. You go over the handlebars. When the moment you go over your handlebars, your brain tells you you're going to die. At that moment, your brain shuts down and does not record the memory of how you're going to die. So when you hit the ground and you come to a rolling to a stop, your brain goes, oh, you didn't die. So let's take an inventory of everything that hurts now. So that's when your pain receptors come back on and your knees and your elbows and your head and all that hurts, okay? Every day these women live in trauma, their brain is telling them you're gonna die. Every day, for weeks, months, years. And when at some point in time they become safe, the brain comes on and goes, you didn't die. Let's take an inventory of everything that ever bad ever happened to you. And so about two weeks in, this happens, and it's a flood, a flood of pain that comes upon them. And they're not medicating themselves now, and they don't know how to help deal with healthy, a healthy way of dealing with all this trauma in their life now, and they're scared, and because of that, they go back. So Dr. Rebecca Campbell, do the research on this. This is very important because this is, really becomes the backbone of an aftercare program. You have to understand this part of it to understand how to provide adequate care, care to them. All right, thank you very much. I just have one last thing before. Uh, it, this is a lot of information to fit in a little bit of time, I'm telling you. But recently I read through this right here. It's the Introduction to Human Trafficking, a guide for criminal justice professionals. It was compiled by the Texas Trafficking Prevention Task Force. It is, a it is comprehensive and we have it available for law enforcement. If you are in law enforcement field, we have one printed out ready to give to you today if you will come see us at our resource table. It is um, some really good information. It's also available online. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. <laughs> panel is education, juvenile justice, and legal remedies for victims. We're going to have Marlene Villarreal with Blue Nation. She's our moderator. Kim Seeger from Catholic Charities of Corpus Christi. Scott Poole with Bear County Juvenile Justice Department. I'm going to ask them again to tell you a little bit about themselves, and then we turn the panel over to you. So Marlene, thank you all. Thank you, good morning everyone. Um, I am so excited to see um, so many people here. State Representative Hunter has done an amazing job the last two years of um, putting this um, summit together, and he's very good about thanking other people, and I wanna take a minute to thank him and honor him for bringing the community together on a very important cause. Uh, 
As he mentioned, my name is Marlene Villarreal, and I am the operations director for Blue Nation. Blue Nation is a local grassroots organization, and our primary focus has been education, awareness, and advocacy on the issue of human trafficking. Um, I heard a lot of things said earlier, and one of those was about a puzzle and how we all are a part of a puzzle, and I am so thankful that we are seeing pieces of the puzzle coming together in our community. Um, myself, Blue Nation, along with some other organizations, New Life Refuge, um, and some other individuals in the community have been doing this for about four or five years, going out and speaking anywhere anyone would invite us to talk about human trafficking. So to see the summit and to see everyone here is a huge accomplishment for our community. Um, we are now moving into victim services. We are not opening a shelter. We are opening something that's called a drop-in center. Um, we are opening a drop-in center in the neighborhood where we know um, that there's a lot of prostitution going on. And we are gonna provide direct services to girls and young women that are involved in the life. So you hear us talk about the life and the game, and we don't really refer to prostitution a lot because it has a very negative connotation. And it says that women are selling themselves is what really when we think of prostitution. And what we know is that prostitution and trafficking are very commingled, as our previous speakers discussed. So we like to say they're in the life or they're in the game, as opposed to using terms like prostitutes or prostitution. And I think it all comes back to the way we look at things. Because when we see or hear the term prostitute, we automatically think they chose that. That's what they want to do. And we would like to change the mindset that not every girl that may be involved in the life is there by choice. So if we can start with the 200, 250, 300 people that are in attendance, that's a huge start. So next time you see someone that may look like she's a prostitute, remember that she may not be there willingly. That the most likely answer is that A, she was either started as a child, with that in and of itself makes her a victim, or B, they're being forced, fraud, or coerced. Our facility is gonna work with women in the life. We're gonna be a hand out of that life. Women involved in the commercial sexual exploitation, whether that's prostitution, pornography, or stripping. If you have a child, Dennis said the average age was 13 years old for girls to enter into prostitution. If you have a child that entered at 13, we come into contact with her at 27, what else does she know? How can she get out of the life if there's not a hand to help her out? We have education initiatives. We're going to have mental and psychological help for them, physical help for them, um, gardening. We have an amazing program lined up. We're in the infant stages. But if you'd like more information, please stop at our info table. To my left, I have Scott Poole. I'm very, very glad that he's here. They have an amazing program in San Antonio. Scott is the assistant supervisor, gang intensive. He's the assistant supervisor with the gang intensive supervision unit with Bear County. And I came to know Scott because last year the DA from Bear County was here and she was talking about these amazing cases that they've had and gotten life sentences for traffickers that were um, trafficking victims, minors, and the probation officer in Bear County probation office were involved in those prosecutions. Um, so I wanted to get in contact with him and find out what program are you utilizing in Bear County that we may be able to utilize in our community to help identify victims. Um, next, we have Kimberly Sager. She is an attorney. She's with the Immigration and Refuge Department of Catholic Charities. And she's going to talk to us a little about, about immigration, um, international issues, and some domestic VAWA, violence against women issues as well. So we're going to start with Kim. Thank you for being here, Kim. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, they're going to make the legal person go first, because if you can stay awake through this, then you're well <laughs> on your way. So um, as I go over these things, don't worry about writing everything down if you're interested in the legal part. At our resource table out in the foyer, we have um, handouts and brochures on all this. The legal side of this is kind of technical, so I'd rather you just kind of listen as I go through some things, and then if you have questions, we can um, talk about it later. Uh, first of all, I also want to thank Todd Hunter and his staff. They've done a wonderful job. The other nonprofits, law enforcement agencies, everybody, it's a big opportunity for us to get together and, and um, cooperate with each other and learn more about this subject. 
Um, second, I want to recognize uh, Linda McCamey, Executive Director of Catholic Charities, is back there. And my boss is Carrie Thompson. She's the Director of Immigration and Refugee Services. She's going to be speaking um, in the next panel about the other services that Catholic Charities offers because we do offer a lot of peripheral. Well, we're not in the exact victim assistance of trafficking. We offer other services at Catholic Charities, so she's going to talk a little bit about that. Um, uh, and I've already told you everything that we're going to cover is on the table outside, so we have business cards and um, you can call us with any questions too. So there's been a great presentation about uh, what's involved with human trafficking, and we come in with a very tiny piece of this because, because we're immigration and refugee services, we deal with international immigrants. That's what we do. So while we do, we know some about domestic trafficking, it's not really our area of expertise, but it's, it's important to know, and also the other thing is that their immediate needs are so much greater than legal, and you've heard that was a really good presentation about the things that come first towards stabilizing these victims, but eventually for the international victims there are uh, legal remedies, and that's what, what I'm going to talk about today. The most common legal remedies for victims of international trafficking are what we call T visas and U visas. The T visas are specifically created for trafficked victims, and I'll go over a little bit about what the requirements are. U visas are uh, also for immigrants. They're victims of, of violent crimes, and there's a whole list of qualifying crimes. One of them is trafficking. Uh, there are many others uh, that are involved, too. They were created by Congress to encourage cooperation with law enforcement. There was a tit for tat. If you've been a victim of a violent crime or you've been trafficked, if you will cooperate with law enforcement to catch the bad guys, then we will give you something in return, which is legal documentation. So a T visa and a U visa are, are very valuable to someone who's here trafficked illegally. Now they're rescued and they're still undocumented. So there are, there are limitations on what they can do legally once they're past the initial trauma. Um, the T visa requirements, as defined by law, they are in the United States due to trafficking. They are complying with any reasonable request from law enforcement for assistance in the investigation or prosecution of human trafficking. There are exceptions if you're under 18 years of old, under 18 years of age, or you um, have a psychological or physical trauma that has incapacitated you. And I do want to, as I go through this, um, because of the pro the cooperation with law enforcement, we are very blessed in this county to have Mark Skirgo's office with the, the DA with Nueces County has been most helpful with us. Uh, his victim assistant assistance unit with Rosa Maria Cervantes has been wonderful and she has helped me answer many stupid questions when I call up and I'm trying to work through this and she they have all been wonderful and I thank you Mark for being so cooperative. So back to TV says if you can demonstrate that you will suffer an extreme hardship if you were removed from the United States, uh, examples could be medical needs that can't be uh, supplied in your country, or you have a government that will not protect you from victimization, um, and other there are other circumstances too. You um, there's a legal term about being admissible to the United States. There can be barriers to your admissibility. That's um, those are legal terms that you may or may not have to come up against. And it's not necessary with TVs is to show that the victim knew that he or she would be subject to, to prostitution, slavery, any of the uh, definitions of trafficking. Um, so that's an important thing to know. You don't have to know that that's what's going to happen to you. There is a yearly cap of 5,000 um, of these TVs is issued every year. With U visas, uh, the victim must have suffered substantial physical or mental abuse as a result of having been a victim of a qualifying crime, and there's a whole list of them. They involve abduction, abusive sexual contact, domestic violence, incest, kidnapping, slavery, rape, trafficking, extortion, false imprisonment, murder, peonage, sexual assault, and there are, are others too. It's quite a comprehensive list. Um, the individual has to have information about that qualifying crime. They must be helpful with law enforcement, again, with providing um, help leading to, uh, with the investigation or prosecution of that crime. And that is where a uh, certification is necessary with the application that's filed with the U visa, and that's um, the, what law enforcement agencies do. It can be the DA's office. It can be 
the police department. There are different qualifying agencies that can do that, but that is a requirement that certification take place. Um, the criminal activity had to have violated U.S. laws. You had to have actually been in the United States when the uh, crime occurred. And there's a yearly cap of 10,000 U visas issued each year. So both the T visas and the U visas provide the ability for the principal applicant to apply um, for visas. And then they can also apply for certain of their, what we call in immigration law, derivatives. It usually is your parents, children, or spouse. Uh, there are some exceptions to it. So visas can be offered to those people. It, probably in trafficking, you wouldn't see that so much, but um, it, it is available. Another um, important thing to know is that victims of trafficking who are non-U.S. citizens uh, may be eligible for certain benefits and services under federal and state programs. So um, once they're certified as, as uh, trafficking victims, um, and that comes in the form of a certification that they've been a victim of a severe, a severe form of trafficking, they've assisted in the investigation or prosecution of the um, perpetrator, and they've applied, actually applied for a T visa, then they become eligible for some immediate benefits. And that's SNAP or food stamps, uh, Medicaid. And in Texas, we have an RCA program that uh, gives cash assistance for eight months. So the minute, it's important to know that the minute you apply for the T visa that you contact the Health and Human Services Department and become eligible for those benefits because it is a financial leg up to get you started, um, get your victims started with some assistance. And for nonprofits who may not have all of the cash reserves to fill in those gaps, it's an important thing for people to be able to use. Um, so with these visas in mind, you should be tuned into situations, some of which we've already discussed, that should raise some red flags. We've already talked about the Rockport incident where um, in bars and spas, these young, mostly I think they were girls, Chinese and from Central America were rescued. Um, I believe they were taken to Houston because this is a kind of a continuing challenge for us to get across what agencies in town can offer help. And, um, but they were taken to Houston and I believe they're um, in the process of being helped now. But there are other places, other um, things that you should kind of be aware of a situation. It could be a household maid who is, um, have her papers withheld from her or her pay and then they're threatened with deportation. That's a very common threat to use against somebody who's uh, particularly labor trafficked. Um, we helped a gentleman from India who was in his 50s who was a, a certified journeyman. He and some other journeymen from India were promised work in Louisiana and they were dumped there. Don't know what happened to their trafficker but disappeared. They had no papers, no money, um, barely spoke the language. He heard about Kiowit hiring, so he made it his way down to Corpus Christi. But of course, Kiowit couldn't hire him because he didn't have uh, any papers. He couldn't, there are lots of stringent rules now on employers to verify documentation with their workers. So he heard about Catholic charities. He came to us, and we were all, he was labor traffic, classic case, and we were able to get his T visa for him and his work authorization. So um, he did get hired at Kiowit. Um, the last remedy I would like to mention is immigration relief under the VAWA Act. A lot of you have heard against, about that. It's called the Violence Against Women's Act. Um, and before I go into that, the VAWA makes me think of it when I say Women's Act. All of these T visas and U visas and VAWA are available to uh, not just women but to men as well. You do hear about situations that applies to. It applies to all ages of people. We, we're not talking just about children. We're talking about adults too. So keep that in mind. Um, under VAWA, it's relief that's offered to spouses and children of either U.S. citizens or LPRs. That's what we call green card holders. They're lawful permanent residents. Um, and the action can be, be pursued without the abuser's assistance or even knowledge. So it's a very powerful uh, tool for the uh, victim to use. Um, what happens with them if, they're, if their VAWA application is approved, they actually get work authorization first. The, the status, adjusting to status as an LPR comes a little bit later. It's not always granted because there are some other conditions. A lot of times people have gone in and out of the country without permission several times and those factors can come into play. There can be, there's a, a, a good moral character requirement and sometimes that um, becomes a problem with some of the things that people have been through. But um, the advantages is that there are certain protections from deportation. 
Uh, they get their employment authorization right away and some public benefits and the opportunity to adjust to LPR status. Um, there are national hotline numbers that have been put on the board with previous talks and uh, they're listed on the handouts on, out on our table. And one last note about legal remedies available for traffic victims is that there are civil remedies under Texas law. Texas is unique, or not, probably other states have it, but we, we do have it too. Victims can sue their traffickers for actual damages, including mental anguish, exemplary damages. They can get their court costs and their attorney's fees paid. So again, all these legal things are down the road after you've helped stabilize the victims, but it is important to know that they, if they're internationally trafficked, that um, they can stay here if they wish with some legal protection and a, and a legal uh, documentation so they don't have to remain undocumented. Um, I was just going to say a little bit about Catholic Charities. A lot of there, a lot of people don't know that we, of course, we are a Catholic organization. We're organized under the Diocese of Corpus Christi, and uh, we're unabashedly Catholic. But Catholic, but the people we help have nothing to do with religion. That question never comes up with the people we assist. Um, we help people who are generally um, lower economic, um, social means. We have a wonderful relationship with the private immigration attorneys in town. Deborah Rodriguez is one of the best. When we have people who can afford to pay, we send them to Deborah. And when she has people who can't pay, she sends them to us. So we work for a reduced fee. There are fee waivers available for many forms. Um, T visas and U visas both have fee waivers because the government charges quite a bit to process those fees, but there are fee waivers available if you can't afford to pay. So keep us in mind, uh, what we do is a very, uh, the T visas and U visas are a very small part of what we do. We do mostly family-based immigration petitions, but we do handle these kinds of visas. So if you find yourself in need of somebody who um, we can help with, by all means, call us. We have our cards, our business cards out on the table. That's uh, all I have for right now. We'll entertain questions later. Thank you, Kim. Um, I think one of the difficulties in identifying human trafficking victims um, speaking internationally right now is that there's a, a term that's used in the anti-trafficking movement that they're hidden in plain sight. Um, we, they talked about it earlier, you could walk next to one in HEB. This particular case that um, came out of Victoria was from a spa, a foot spa, I believe. And someone saw something that didn't look right. There may be prostitution going on and a tip was called in. That's why awareness and education is so key. Um, both New Life and Blue Nation offer presentations, trainings, educations, um, education opportunities that our organizations can come in and train your organization, church, youth group on what to look for, how to identify. Um, we actually get tips um, from an organization out of Houston, Rio Grande, I'm sorry, out of Austin, Rio Grande Legal Aid that'll call me and say, hey Marlene, we have this tip, something doesn't look right, we got a tip to the national hotline, can you go and check this place out? And so I will on occasion go get my nails done, get a pedicure, and see what's going on in a particular business. Because that's what you have to do. You have to go in and patron these businesses that could be potential human trafficking organizations. I'm not saying all nail salons, all nail salons have human trafficking victims, but we have seen them in nail salons, spas, bars, clubs, brothels, how do you find them if we don't go and look for them? So I'm going to put in a plug for our organizations. If you want to go in and we can call on you and you want to volunteer, stop by our tables and say, hey, I want to volunteer. This is something I can do. I just want to know what are the red flags. We're not really doing a lot of that at this summit, but we can come to your organizations and train specifically on those issues. And the other difficulty we have is that we see a lot about international victims getting a lot of services, which we're very grateful for. We're thankful for that. But unfortunately, our domestic victims aren't offered some of the same opportunities. So we're going to switch gears a little bit, and we're going to talk about domestic minor sex trafficking. And that's the exploitation of America's kids. That's our youth. That's what's happening here in our community. We have a human trafficking case that was blown up, headlines, human trafficking all over the news. We heard about it for days. The reality is that our children are being exploited every day in our community. 
There are children being bought and sold outside of the doors every day. What does that look like? How can we help them? First key is awareness. Second is identifying. Where can we find those victims? And that's what Scott's going to talk to us about today. San Antonio has developed a great program that they use in their juvenile justice system to help identify children within that system. Um, vulnerable youth are key to being exploited. Um, runaway youth. In our community, we don't have a runaway shelter. So where are our runaway kids at? Who's helping them? Survival sex, hey, you can come sleep at my house and crash on my couch, but you're gonna, you're gonna do me favors. That's domestic minor sex trafficking. So I'm gonna turn it over to Scott and he's gonna talk to us about what's happening in Bear County. Hi, thank Representative Hunter for or having us down here. And uh, we uh, wanted to tell y'all a little bit about what we're doing in Bear County. Uh, when we first started 2008, 2009, we had one probation officer go to a kid in a residential placement setting and for some reason he thought he should go in there and ask her a few more questions about what was going on in her life. And she came out and eventually told the whole story of being held in a house and being trafficked for a couple of years by two brothers. After about two and a half years, the case finally went to court. The two brothers ended up, one got four life sentences and the other got three. Um, so that made a group of us think that there was more going on than meets the eye. If you just look at the statistics in Bear County, from 1980 until two weeks ago, we had 117 girls uh, referred to our department for prostitution. In 30 years, only 117. So the statistics don't hold up, but they don't tell the truth because there's more going on than that. Since we started keeping track in 2009, up until last week, we've had 65 girls make statements and make outcries. We've had another 20 that we know are trafficking, but they won't talk about it. And so that's around 85 that we know of in the last seven years. So there's a lot more going on out there, and that's only girls referred to Bear County Juvenile Probation. That's not counting all the runaways that go through the San Antonio Police Department and the Bear County Sheriff's Department. There's hundreds of girls that go through there. So we're working to uh, make things better for the kids that come in our, come in our department and the kids that, that uh, come through the police department and the sheriff's department because we're, they're also tra doing training and learning more all the time. Uh, ways that we have been able to find victims is something that we developed through processes that we already had active with the probation department so it didn't cost the department to do anything different we just had to look at the information we had and apply it in a different manner uh, when we had a child that is referred to our department if she comes in for minor referrals that's kind of sometimes some of the clues that we look at let's say she comes in for a runaway or for resisting arrest uh, we want to pull that file out and look at it a little more when we'll read the police report a lot of times in the police report She's a runaway. She was found with a 25-year-old guy. That's usually a clue that what's she doing with a 25-year-old guy that, that uh, is not related to her. And so that's a case we might want to look at a little closer. When they're brought in our de detention center, they receive a, it's a screening test. It's called a Macy. I can't remember the actual uh, name of it, but it's called a Macy. And, it, and it's 52 questions designed to see if they are suicidal, to see if they have, um, drug abuse problems and there's also a section on there for trauma and we when we see a high trauma score we use that as an indicator as a kid that we want to go talk to the kids that uh, get detained in our detention center they're also asked if they've ever been victims of sexual assault or uh, sexual abuse if they answer yes to that again another kid we want to go talk to so we're trying to what we're trying to do is screen you know we have 30 referrals every day probably to our department so we're trying to screen them down to see who we want to need to spend our time to and who we need to talk to so once we get the girls screened down to a certain point and sometimes boys mostly girls uh, we will go talk to them and we do an interview uh, before we do that interview we do a lot of background on them if they have CPS history we try to get CPS and read all those reports to see who the who they have victimized them in the past uh, we read every police report to see who their friends are, uh, to see who they were arrested with in the past. If they have psychological reports, we'll read that and see what's in there. So it may, we may not be able to interview them right away, but eventually we'll get in to interview them. 
And, uh, and in the interviews are total change for probation. I spent the first 16 years of my career not asking certain questions because it was kind of taboo to ask a kid about their sex life, to ask them what kind of things were going on with them. We found that if you don't ask those kind of questions, you're not going to get the answers. You know, I, I had a girl tell me one time, I'm glad you asked that. Eventually she told me about being prostituted in Dallas, Houston, uh, Austin, San Antonio, uh, Oklahoma City, uh, but nobody ever asked her. You have to ask questions in order to get responses from the kids. So in this process we've developed, it seemed to have worked out. We've interviewed over 200 girls. Again, we've had about 65 kids that admit to being uh, trafficked, and another 20 we know are trafficked, but they won't admit to it. Uh, the victims are hard. It's hard to get information because, as other speakers have said, they don't see themselves as victims. They don't understand that these people are taking advantage of them. They may be making thousands of dollars a day off of the girl, and she's getting a hamburger out of it but she thinks she's getting affection and love from this guy, so she won't really talk about him. So it's hard to get them to convince them to speak. Uh, very difficult for law enforcement to do it, time constraints. You know, before we go interview a good kid, I may spend two hours just looking into her background because if you don't know what to ask, they're not going to elicit any type of response. Law enforcement picks a kid up in a motel parking lot. They don't want to give him any information. He's got her for criminal trespass. He's got to move her on down the line. So somebody else has to pick up the uh, ball, whether it's CPS or whether it's juvenile probation. I think CPS and juvenile probation are in the best spots uh, to be able to identify domestic minor sex trafficking victims because we know the kids. We're able to spend more time with them, and uh, we're able to do a little more research before we do talk to them. Uh, most of the girls that we interview are locked in our detention facility. They have committed an offense. Uh, they are victims, but they've also committed some type of offense. And uh, that time in detention gives us an opportunity to interview them. Uh, we haven't had much success going to the homes and talking to them when we do find them at home. Uh, the detention center seems to be a better location for it. Again, I heard y'all talking about cost. Costs are, are important because for years we've taken girls and placed them repeatedly. And it is not cheap to put a kid in a residential placement. But the problem were, was that they weren't receiving the right type of therapy that they needed. Uh, Trauma-informed therapy is big for these kids, and uh, in the past they haven't received that. You know, they go to anger management, substance abuse, and family issues, but they're not getting to the core of it. In the last couple of years, we've been cha changing that so that they're getting the trauma-informed counseling that they need, and that we're working on those issues. And again, we were spending money on already. We just weren't spending it the right way. Uh, most of the tools we use to help them, probation's already been using. But again, we have to use those tools in the right way. In our process, because we have so many referrals to our department, we, have, we act as a screening tool for law enforcement. I have a, another partner, and I also have a female partner, and we will go in and interview these girls, and if they're willing to talk to us, we get law enforcement involved. Uh, if they're not willing to talk to us, we'll inform law enforcement, Sometimes they'll come down and talk to them, sometimes they won't, because they, there's only so many officers that can work with uh, victims of trafficking, and, they, ha and it, uh, they have a lot, spend a lot of time working other cases. So we try to just to be a screen for them. Uh, if we keep calling them on every kid we thought was trafficked, they'd quit coming. Uh, and, and they just don't have the time to go, so we're, we're a screening tool for them. Uh, and we're also able to get services to the victim much quicker. If a girl tells me she's a victim of sexual assault uh, or she's a victim of trafficking, I can get a rape crisis center in there within a couple of days, uh, sometimes the next day. Uh, I can let the counselors in our detention center know that day so they can, you know, talk to the kid, try to, to uh, work with them that, in that aspect. And uh, we have an ongoing relationship with rape crisis center in, in uh, San Antonio and they do counseling in our detention center with girls and they also do counseling when they're in the community so we work with that so that's the big part is finding the victims when we found these victims our, initially we didn't know what type of problem we had was there enough enough of a problem to develop a placement for these girls was there enough of a problem to have a court for them and the stats hold up that yeah we, we had a big enough oh thank you that's okay <laughs> 
we had a big enough problem that we needed to do a little more. So at Judge Parker uh, ended up opening up the restore court earlier this year. And in that court, it's designed so that the judge can get a personal relationship with each victim, that she can work closely with them. Uh, it's an informal setting. She can, she's kind of like a mentor for the family and the kids, uh, along with our uh, restore court staff. Uh, the probation officers that work with these girls are, are, have been through a lot, a lot of training to try to help address their issues. Uh, typical probation, do what I say, do it when I say it, and why didn't you do what I, what I told you to do? With the restore court probation officer, we're a little more lenient. We try to work with them. We're trying to help them out because we know their key issue is that they were victims and they were traumatized, and that's why they're out doing the things they do. Uh, so the probation officers have that training. The district attorney who is there also has training. She's more lenient toward these uh, children because she knows that of the trauma they've been in. I mean, when we tell them the things that they've been through and they read the police reports, you know, things are pretty graphic and pretty horrible for a lot of these kids. So you get to be a little more lenient. The attorneys representing them, I'm also familiar with it, just not some other attorney. It's, we have one attorney that pretty much represents all the girls that are in the restore court. We do the trauma-informed services uh, in, when the kids are in the community or if they're in a facility. Uh, we have a facility in Bear County, but there's other, other facilities around the state uh, that we contract with, Rockdale and Granbury. They have uh, trauma-informed services there. They do uh, counseling for victims of trafficking. Uh, they're secure facilities so that the girls can't run away. Uh, they do have a chronic runaway problem. I know that some people probably will think, well, they're victims, why are you locking them up? Because they need the services, and if we don't have them in a secure facility, they will run away. One of the key factors for looking at traffic, traffic victims is three or more runaways before the age of 13. Three or more runaways before the age of 13. So if we get them out and put them back in the community, they're going to run away. They're going to go back to the traffickers. This is their boyfriend. This is the guy they love. He shows them things that his family, that her family doesn't. Uh, so, it's it's a difficult situation because we want to put them back in the community because someday they're going to be back there. But we do end up uh, putting a lot of them in pl residential placement. Uh, but we try to use, just depending on each case. Some cases we'll put at home. Uh, and try to work with them in the community. Some cases, we'll put them in residential placement first referral because they, they may be 16 and they've been doing this for four years. So we're going to try to get them out of their life. Uh, some of the benefits of, for the child to be in restore court is they can get their record sealed that they've never been on probation. You know, if Army calls and says, this kid ever been there? Nope, never had her. So that's one of the benefits for her uh, and the services. And we're trying to re reduce the recidivism rate. Before we did anything with these girls, recidiv recidivism rate was horrible. They would come back, or they would get off probation and still get be back doing the same thing, but they wouldn't get picked up. So it's it's uh, hopefully this will work very well. Uh, earlier this year, also we started our Mission Road Center for Girls. We realized that we needed a placement in San Antonio because of the amount of girls we had. Uh, we needed the families involved. Uh, we needed the parents. Uh, we needed local agencies involved with, with the children. So we opened up uh, the Mission Road Center, or we call it MRC. And uh, it's a safe, secure environment. It, you, it's part of our detention center, but it's not part of our detention center. Because of funding reasons, we used that part of the facility, but we run it much different than we run our detention center. The girls are able to have more property on them. They're, they, they wear a different uniform, more like a school uniform. Uh, and it's run a lot different. Uh, have intensive uh, program in there for therapy and counseling. It's all trauma-informed counseling. Uh, our target population is 13 to 17. It's hard to place for 17-year-old girls because in the juvenile system at 18, we lose uh, jurisdiction over them, and we want at least a nine-month program. I mean, in nine months, for people who've been trafficked is a minimum, a minimum. That's kind of where we work in with the NGOs is that after the nine months, Maybe there's a safe house somewhere that we can put them in, especially the girls that are aging out. So we try to work with our NGOs to help them transition into adulthood. Uh, and our facility is small. It's only for kids in, who, who are on probation in Bear County, and it's just a 12-bed facility right now. 
So some of our girls are still in, in different places, but um, that's going to expand eventually. It's oh, okay. And then I want to talk a little bit about our coalition. The coalition is we have a huge coalition. But we have meetings every, every couple of months, and we'll have 30, 35, 40 people there. And it actually started with Catholic Charities back in 2008, 2009. So they were the, the spearhead of all this. Uh, the coalition's been open probably a little more than five years, and uh, non-government organizations are there. Everybody has a little input. One of our main goals is public awareness, to make the public aware. The other one is to provide uh, treatment and to provide safe houses for girls and women, because in the coalition we deal with adults as well. Uh, so trying to find safe houses for them. and. Uh, we just try to find services for the family. The coalition works pretty well. Uh, and um, one of the main issues is training, and, and that's what we do. We train schools, we train police departments. I was just here for Corpus Christi Probation Department, juvenile probation, and uh, try to train anybody, anybody we can because, like I said, for 16 years, I didn't see the problem. Same girls, same issues, didn't see it. My boss has been there 25 years, he didn't either, but in the last I guess since 2008, our eyes have been open and we see things a little differently. So uh, that's all I have from Bear County. And if you need to get a hold of us, our contact numbers are on here and we're willing to help in any way we can. Thank you. I'd like to take a poll in the room. How many of you work directly with children in some form or fashion? How many of you work with children that would be considered troubled youth? So what I want to ask you is the next time you come into contact with them or you're in counseling with them or you're mentoring them, um, just take a second look. Are they chronic runaways? Why are they running away? We had a speaker say earlier, they're not running to something, they're running from something. And we know runaway youth are the most, or a, a very large vulnerable population in our youth. So if you're working with youth, if you're working with children and they're considered troubled youth, um, and, and unfortunately, I think a lot of times they get labeled that way. They're the bad kids, they're the runaways. Um, there's a term that's used that's really sad and I don't even care to use it, but it's out there and it's the throwaway youths. It's the youth that the parents say, I can't deal with you, I can't handle you, get out. Go fend for yourself. And that's reality. Um, but when instead of labeling them just as troubled youth, why are they troubled? Take a second look. Because let me tell you what, um, if it was my daughter, I would want someone to take a second look. Because we always think it's somebody else's child. Oh, that doesn't happen to my family. That won't happen in my community. Unfortunately, nowadays, because of the breakup in the family, there's a lot of kids that are in one parent homes. And most often than not, it's with the mother. So there's a fatherless generation that's out there, and they're just looking for love and attention from a male figure. So you have an older boy who comes in and shows a young girl attention and love and buys her gifts, and boom, she gets hooked quick. And let's clarify this too, that it's not just girls. It's boys too. Boys are being trafficked, and I don't know the stat off the top of my head, but I know that the average age for the boys to be trafficked is even younger than the girls. So it's not just a girl issue. While we do focus on that a lot, and there probably are more services available for girls than there are boys, it is a boy issue as well. And it goes back to our society. What this generation allows, the next generation embraces. So as a community, I believe that we can take a stand starting now, tomorrow, today. Why tomorrow? Let's do it today and say this is not happening in our community. We're not gonna allow this anymore. We're not gonna allow our children to be exploited. Um, and they're not troubled youth. They're somebody's child. So uh, I don't even know what if we have time. I, I didn't even bring my, good. Okay, we wanna field any questions. If anyone has any questions, Q&A for either Scott or Kim or myself. Anyone at all? I have a question about your instrument. Massachusetts Assessment of Youth Instrument. I don't know what the S. I can't remember what the S is for. 
M A Y S I. Yes, sir. Correct. Need to get on top of it. And I'm also struck by the fact that everything I'm hearing here is reactive, not proactive. So we're not going to do anything to stop that growth. We're just going to minister to the growth. Is, are there any proactive uh, solutions? I know there are some preventative programs that um, we are starting to use here in our community going into schools and into youth groups to talk to primarily the children on how not to be exploited, how not to fall into the traps of a trafficker. Um, the reason you're hearing a lot about reactive is because the awareness has been such that we are identifying victims now. And with that identification comes the understanding that there are very few services for them. So we're kind of playing catch up in that we've been raising awareness, now we're discovering victims, and what do we do with them? Where do we put them? How can we help them? And so you're right, we do need to do preventative measures as well. I was gonna offer one thing too, and maybe Mark Skirka would like to comment on this. Um, I think the last couple of years since Todd first started these summits, the, the change in how law enforcement approaches who's the victim and who's the bad guy, you know, because you can only throw the women and young people in jail and then they're back out in the situation again instead of concentrating off on the uh, traffickers themselves. And I think there's been a change in that. I don't know if Mark has anything to say about that or he says, thanks for putting me on the spot. You're welcome. <laughs> right.
And that's absolutely true, and I would like to address that for a minute, because I am part of that diversion program with CCPD, or our organization is, and it is an amazing program. So as opposed to recriminalizing women in the life over and over and over, they're offering services for them if they're eligible. Because if, they're, if they have former violent crimes, they may not be eligible for the program. Um, but it's to take them off the street. And to they, I met with Chief Simpson personally, and he understands that they are, in fact, victims. There are victims. Not all of them, I'm not going to say that, that all of them are victims, but there are victims within there. And so the prostitution diversion program is an amazing program. We also have the demand side of it. While we're doing these operations and we're having prostitution stings, the buyers are walking away. When you talk about arrest, you're talking about women who are getting arrested. The victims are getting arrested more often than the pimps who are making all the money, or let's change that, the traffickers who are making all the monies and the guys who are buying them. The guys who are buying them are often walking away. I am grateful for our diversion program. I love it, I'm a part of it, we're victim advocates there. We're going the next step, beginning the new year, to start hitting the demand side of it as well. You're gonna see some things coming out. They realize, they recognize it's a process, it's something that needs to be addressed, and it's coming to our community. So that's a big plus, but we're absolutely right. And that goes back to the fall of families and sexualizing women. It's a whole culture. It's a culture now that really has to be changed. And that starts with each one of us in the room, changing the mindset of this whole glamorizing, this prostitution and pimp mentality, that it's cool. I mean, how many of you have heard the phrase, pimp my ride, that's pimp. Kids use it all the time. It's a cool thing. It's not, it's derogatory. It's violent. I heard stories of 13, 14 year old girls and what they had to endure at the hands of their buyers or their traffickers and it is horrific. We cannot, we can no longer glorify it. And if we can make a commitment here today to say I'm changing my mindset, that's 300 people that made that commitment. That changes a culture. That changes the mentality of a community. And we're going to, you're going to ask the question and we're going to, we're going to direct it back. I'm going to repeat your question because the overflow rooms can't hear. Yes, ma'am, Marita. Okay. Uh, Scott, in your mission, in your mission center, uh, can you give in a specific uh, intensive treatment as part of the uh, security and emotional stress of the victims? I'm not sure I understand. No. Is that directed to me or Scott? Okay. I'm not a clinician. I'm a probation officer, so I really can't tell you exactly what type of therapy they do. I know it's trauma-informed therapy, but I can't tell you exactly what modality it is and what they use in there. Right, and I think, yeah, and I can speak to myself and I can speak a little bit for, for new life. They're going to have um, recreation therapy. I don't know how to explain it. A, a, life skills. I know you're going to be doing therapy with horses, um, drama, and art. Um, in our facility, we're going to be having gardening, um, sewing, cooking, um, just things that are more um, emotional therapeutic that women in the life may have not been offered while living in the life. You have to understand, these women wake up, work in the commercial sex trade, go to sleep, wake up. They don't really have hobbies and stuff that they do. So those are things that are going to, I know speaking from our community and our local facilities, those are things that are going to be offered as therapeutic art, 
gardening, um, horse therapy, those are things that are being uh, programmed into our programs. Yes, sir. Okay, the question was a legal question, that if a business owner or a legal owner of an entity knows that human trafficking is involved, can they be cross prosecuted and held accountable for that? And from my understanding, I am not a legal expert, I'm gonna look at Dennis and Mark um, on that, but from what I understand, the new law that passed, if they are facilitating, if they're an organization that facilitates human trafficking knowingly, they know that it's there, then they can be prosecuted. They can be held accountable for that. Is that correct, Dennis? Yes, it, depends. it depends. There's a lot of factors depending on that, but it can result in civil penalties or criminal penalties and it is a, it's a passive, a passive understanding of what you can prove in a court of law. Okay, so the answer to that was that yes, but there are some intricacies in that based on what can be proven in a court of law. So there is a law that um, deals specifically with that, if, a, if an organization, nail salon, business, whatever it may be, knowingly allows human trafficking in their organization, they can be held accountable, but it's what you can prove they knew and how much they knew. Any other questions? Okay. Then I think, yes, ma'am. You mentioned that just a few years ago you were awakened and became aware after many, many years of being unaware. What was it that awakened you? What, what con uh, contact, what kind of experience? I believe it was the making that one case that, you know, he, this probation officer went and asked just a few more questions and it's kind of, you know, talking about sex with a kid is kind of taboo, whether you're trying to find out if they're being abused or whether you're trying to find a lot of things. And uh, once we kind of opened that door, it was like, okay, you know, we can ask these kind of questions to try to help the kid. But you had experiences before that that were similar. There was something that... Well, the, girl, the, the, the girls had the same background, the same issues, chronic runaways. Uh, we'd go to, we would put them in residential placement for minor offenses, but they would keep coming back and going back to placement. Uh, even in earlier times, we'd even commit them to Texas Youth Commission for minor offenses. Uh, because of their chronic runaway. And then when I look back on it now, I realize that a lot of those girls had the same issue. This is not a new issue. There's an article that I have in one of the presentations, 1977. It could have been written today. That was 30 years ago. And it talks about the Montrose District in Houston. I mean, it, it's the same issue that's been going on for years. It's just come to light now. But, you know, we really weren't trained at all to look for that. More criminal, not following probation conditions. And for, for probation departments, it's kind of a change that we're actually looking for something else uh, to try to help people that have been, you know, victims of abuse and victims of long-term mistreatment. And really, we're finding that's what's basically causing their legal problems as well. It's the trauma that they had when they were three, you know? One of the other things I'm wondering about or questioning, uh, you mentioned the glamorization of prostitution. Uh, the lack of awareness because media is so powerful 
the violence that we experience every day just watching TV. Uh, every program is probably a crime investigative program. Um, films like Pretty Women and, and uh, subsequent films where it's kind of glamorized. What's being done, because media is so powerful in shaping social consciousness, what can be done or what is being done to get media more connected as part of the coalition? Uh, I'm glad you used the word coalition because I wanted to put in a plug for the coalition, actually. Um, we do have a local coalition. It's the Coastal Bend. We have two of them. One of them is the Coastal Bend Coalition Against Modern Day Slavery. And there's the Coastal Bend Human Trafficking Coalition. And one of them is represented outside. So if you are with an organization and you say, I want to be a part of this, our organization wants to partner in this fight in the community, stop by the table on the outside and get some information. We meet every third Thursday of the month. And the second coalition meets, I think, once every three months. So you have an opportunity to be a piece of the puzzle. There, We've got great organizations. So, um, you know, my husband and I were driving down the freeway the other day, and near my home, there was a billboard for an auto parts store. And it had all these auto parts and call us and we can find your parts. And then it has a lady with a tank top with her business hanging out. And I told my husband, what does that have to do with auto parts? Why do they have to have a girl in a tank top with all her business to sell auto parts? But unfortunately, the old cliche, sex sells. Um, what I can do is not buy anything from that store because I don't condone how they're advertising. What I can do is, as an individual, which if each one of us makes that decision, it works as a group collectively, is to turn off that TV. It's to write that NBC, ABC, CBS, and say this kind of programming is inappropriate. It's a huge conglomerate. But we can start one person at a time. There's 300 of us in the room. It's changing our mindset that's going to change a culture. Years ago, domestic violence was something that wasn't talked about, wasn't heard of. It was hush-hush. It was behind closed doors. Now it's a huge, there's shelters, there's, it's a huge movement. They have been very, very successful. Um, we can do the same thing. We can, but it's working one person at a time. And that is what's going to shift a culture. It's going to shift our mindsets of our community and saying, we're not going to allow that here. I don't even know if it was a local. I hope the business owner is not in here. If he is, I'm sorry. Uh, he or she. Well, I've got to stop us right now because we're <laughs> at 11. I want to tell you, panel, thank you very much. Anybody have any questions, they'll be here for a little bit. Thank you. Go to our next panel, The Reason for the Rescue the faith-based initiative. And our panelists, or Didi, now Didi, raise your hand right here. Bay Area Fellowship. <laughs> Pastor David with Rock City. I know it's tough for you to raise your hand with this group right here. <laughs> and Carolyn Thompson with, uh, Carolyn, raise your hand with Catholic Charities of Corpus Christi. And, uh, we have been working on this. Let me make a little comment on this one. You know, a lot of times they, uh, a victim or a family or survivor will not go to some of us, but they will go to our faith-based groups. And I want to compliment these three and Menta in particular because their groups have been very, very closely working with us. And you'll see that some of them have tables out here, and I'd like you to visit with them as well because we get contacts on who they should go to to talk. And so they play a huge role, and they also have done a great job on educating our community on what's going on. So panelists, thank you. I kind of think we have co-moderators uh, right here. But anyway, I'll leave it to you. Thank you so much.
I just want to introduce our panel real quickly. Um, I'll let them tell you a little bit about themselves. Um, but Pastor David Bendet is um, the senior pastor of Rock City Church. And if you had some coffee this morning, he's also the owner of Coffee Waves. Yeah. And um, also we have um, Carrie Thompson. She's the attorney and director of Immigration and Refugee Department for Catholic Charities. Um, I'm Dee Dee Sharon, and um, I um, am a the executive assistant to Pastor Bill and Jessica Cornelius at Bay Area Fellowship, and I also have a hand in some of the mission work that we do locally and abroad. Um, so I am going to kick it off to you, Pastor. All right. Thank you all so much for being here this morning. I think it was pretty obvious that I was the pastor of Rock City Church. Uh, we're, we're not called Rock City because we're rock and rollers. We're called Rock City because we believe that we're the city built on the rock. And we have a vision to see this city live up to its namesake, which is the body of Christ, Texas. I'd like to take a moment to honor other leaders that are here. I'm so thankful for our legislative leaders, the judges, the councilmen, and others. But I'd also like to acknowledge the spiritual leaders here who really pray and take time to affect the spiritual atmosphere of our city and also front, uh, fight on the front lines of the war. Uh, that would be is Dorothy Dundas here from the uh, regional director of the Texas Apostolic Prayer Network? Oh, she stepped out, okay. And of course, I saw Bill Word and Cindy Mutchler and Nancy Ilse. Uh, they represent other churches. And if you are a ministry leader here or a pastor of a church, if you lead at your current church or are a, a pastor, would you please stand for a quick moment? Come on, stand up. Let's give them all a hand clap this morning. Uh, human trafficking first uh, came into my life many, many years ago. I was very unaware of what it was. And I'll tell you a quick story that's kind of fun. When I was going to Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, Oklahoma, I used to go to the pool halls to play in pool tournaments. Now, I wasn't gambling and hustling people for money, but I had a desire to go into the dark places. And I was at a Christian university attending a church, and I was tired of living in a little Christian bubble. So I started to go and shoot pool at the local pool halls and play in tournaments. And I played pool when I was young and was very good at it. And I started winning some of the tournaments, which in turn gave me a really good influence with a lot of people. They were very surprised that I wasn't drinking, smoking, cussing. And there I was. I had crosses and Christian symbols on my pool cue. And they were shocked that I was coming in and winning these tournaments. And so I was able to really influence a lot of people in, in a, a very dark place. And one night, one of the guys that I had been kind of pouring into at the pool hall, who had my phone number, called me up and said, hey, there are two girls that are traveling around dancing at strip clubs. And they're beautiful and they're hot. And I was thinking about you because you had told me a story how a long time ago you used to buy and sell drugs. Now, that was years and years ago. But for some odd reason, he thought I still did. I'm not sure why. <laughs> And so, um, but it was a divine setup. And so he calls me and I was living in an apartment complex and he was at the gate to come into the, to the complex and he buzzed me in, he buzzed me and said, hey, I've got these two beautiful girls who are traveling around dancing and I want you to meet them. We wanna come over and we wanna hang out. And I said to him, I said, look, it's a weekend night. I'm, you know, I don't really have time right now. And he said, come on, man, open the gate, open the gate. And so I put the phone down and I said, oh, Lord, what do you want me to do here? And I felt like the Lord said, open the gate. And so I opened the gate and they came. And uh, this guy had never been to my apartment, but my apartment was, it was very obvious that I was a Christian. I had a lot of things in my uh, home that represented my faith in Christ. And as soon as he opened up the door and the girls were, th were there with him, one of the girls saw one of the plaques that I had. It said something like, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And she ran in and she said to her other friend, look, look. And then she looked at me and said, are you a Christian? And I said, yeah, I am. Well, the, the guy was like, okay, it's time for us to leave and get out of here. The party's <laughs> over. But nonetheless, uh, the one girl says, no, let's hang out for a little while. And so I was doing laundry, and I needed to go get my laundry out of the little laundry mat in my complex. And the one girl says, can I go with you? And I said, absolutely. So she comes with me, and I saw it as an opportunity for me to really love on her spiritually. And I was very excited. And she looked at me, and she said, are you on drugs? Are you high? And I said, no. Why? She said, well, your eyes, your pupils are so dilated. 
And I said to her something to the effect of, no, it's just I'm really fired up for the Lord and I really love him a whole lot and I'm, and I'm a passionate guy. And she said, wow. And so we started talking about the Lord, went back to the apartment. And as soon as we got back, my friend that I knew from the pool hall was ready to run out the door as fast as he could. So I hand wrote a note to the girl uh, where my church was and she came just so happened to come the next morning. I didn't realize she was there. Came in a really short mini skirt. It was all the clothes that she had. It was a powerful church service that morning. She wound up coming to the altar, giving her life to Christ, and waited for me till the end to tell me how much it meant to her and that she had decided to get off the road, to break her relations with the pimp that was sponsoring them, and to go home. And then uh, her friend pretty much disowned her, but she decided to go home. And to this day, she's living for the Lord. In fact, she was pregnant at the time and didn't even realize it. And it's a beautiful testimony of somebody that was caught up into a lifestyle that was unhealthy, that turned around and made a difference, now has children and lives for Christ. It's important to know that this issue is on all of our doorsteps every single day. In my church, people walk in all the time with addictions, especially addictions to pornography. It's very, very high in our own community and in our own culture. Every day when we drive down SPID, we see the strip clubs. And the strip clubs are hubs for human trafficking, hubs that fuel the fire of this dysfunction. And most of us, unfortunately, turn a blind eye to it, okay? These organizations do no good for our society. The taxes that they pay do not benefit us in any way. We simply can't keep turning a blind eye to it. It's from turning a blind eye that so much of the dysfunctional laws in our society have been enacted because we didn't take a stand. I also am a, the leader of a local biker ministry called the Tribe of Judah. The Tribe of Judah is a ministry that specifically focuses on outlaw bikers. The outlaw biker world is a very dark world that does its best to hide itself from you. Okay? And I'm going to tell you that in the outlaw biker world, human trafficking and sex slavery is very, very, very high. Women that are caught up into the outlaw biker world are called property. This is very real, and it's happening right here. They're called old ladies, and many of them wear patches that say they're the property of a particular person. In some cases, they're the property of one person, and in other cases, they're the property of the, of the entire outlaw biker chapter. So I make it a point to go get into that world, to love on these people, to influence them, and hopefully to make a change. But I'm telling you that it's all around us, and none of us can afford to live in a bubble. We all need to make a decision to take a stand, and we need the practical tools of what that looks like. And I'm so thankful for this conference because it's giving us so many tools. There's so many great statistics and organizations that are being represented here that give you tools of how you can get involved. But I want to address this issue from a little bit of a different perspective today. We have to understand that this really is first a spiritual issue. And I'm going to quote a scripture to you that many of you may not be aware of. But Paul, in talking to his spiritual son, Timothy, addressed the issue of the perilous times that we live in, in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And Paul specifically is teaching his spiritual son about the perilous times, the end times that we live in. Now, when I say the end times, that doesn't mean the world's going to end tomorrow or next week or next year, and it may not even happen in our generation or lifetime. But the point is, is biblically they define their times as the end times from the first coming of Christ until the second coming. And in these times, we're seeing extremely, extremely perilous issues in our society. And I think we all know that, and that's why we're here today. But he says that men will be lovers of themselves. This is 2 Timothy 3 that they'll be unholy, that they'll be brutal, that they'll be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And without loving God, you can never really love other people properly. He says about these people that these are the sort, verse 6, that creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins and led away by various lusts. If you look up that word gullible, it actually means to be taken a prisoner and to be captive. Okay? These people, the buyers and sellers, and all of us who choose to give in to the dysfunction of pornography, the things that are coming out of Hollywood, and so many other things that are not kingdom-minded, they creep into the households. 
of people that are burdened, beat up, and hurting. And in turn, they get led away by their own hurts and pains. That's not always the case, and I understand that. There are children whose parents at an early age push them into certain things, and children a lot of times don't know better, okay? And so we have to address the issue at the root cause of what's really going on, and we have to have practical tools of how to deal with it. Most of us here today should have a basic understanding regarding the issues that we face personally and as a society. We should all have a basic understanding. On a personal level, we should realize that things like drug addiction, anger, infidelity, alcoholism, depression, pornography, and isolation can stem from deeper rooted issues embedded deep within our own hearts. As a pastor, I've often found that these heart issues spring from places of hurt and pain, initiated from abandonment, neglect, abuse, and serious development issues. And though not all of the time, more often than not, the common factor that links hurting and broken people together stems from broken homes, misguided parents, and a lack of true godly examples to follow. I was a youth pastor for five years and I had a hundred senior high school students. Can I tell you my biggest issue was never with the students. It was always with the parents. Heal the heart and you solve the problem. Fix the family unit and you restore God's original blueprint for his kingdom. Sons and daughters in love with their father on earth as it is in heaven. Solving the problem starts with me. Solving the problem starts with you, your family, your social circle, and inevitably our own community. From our faith and how we treat our family to how we spend our money and what we do behind closed doors. Because I've often said, what makes a man or a woman is not what you do in the public eye, it's who you are when no one's watching and the door is closed. The way that we live our lives is critical. These are the areas of change that can only come from a true heart transformation. And I'm gonna tell all of you that a true heart transformation can only come through Christ. The difference between Christianity and every other world religion is that we're transformed from the inside out, not from programs, but from a genuine heart change from the spirit of the living God dwelling inside of us. As a society, the resolution really is simple. Change the people and you change the city. Not in a cultural sense of changing ethnicities and cultural traditions, unless they're unbiblical, but rather in a sense of advancing a kingdom culture that transforms the hearts and mindsets of people. This is an advancement that causes effectual change in the way people live, act, and treat one another. And now enter the issue of human trafficking and the sex slave industry that plagues our city, state, and the nations of the world. Unfortunately, it's obvious to see how such a dark deception can plague our society. Hurting people hurt people. Remember that. At the convenience store, the gas station, your coworker, and everywhere you go, when people mistreat you, it's because they're hurting on the inside themselves. And when you have a society of hurting and broken people, you will consistently see the need for self-gratification at all cost. Couple this with a very real demonic force that seeks to kill, steal, and destroy. And well, buying and selling people simply becomes a byproduct of our own dysfunction. Unfortunately, until Jesus returns, there will always be buyers and sellers, and there will always be an adversary fueling the fire of this sickness. But there's hope hope that we can make a difference in the hearts and lives of people, in their homes, in families, in our children, and in our teenagers. What is that hope and what are the solutions? I wish I had more time, but unfortunately I don't. It's tough to give a minister only 15 minutes, okay? <laughs> but I will say this, this morning, and please listen closely to what I have to say. From the will of the people, and the empowerment of God comes justice. This is justice for us, 
justice for our children, and as God commands in Amos chapter 5, verse 15, it's establishing justice at the city gates. And it's the city gates, it's at the city gates that godly legislation is enacted and implemented. It's vitally important that we deal with the issue of human trafficking at the core root of the problem. And it's vitally important we work together to do it. We need each other. And to battle such a darkness without each other is simple foolishness. That's the purpose of this conference today and for the conferences to come. And I hope there will be many, many, many more conferences. Conferences should go on all the time because so many people are unaware of what's really taking place. To bring unity amongst all of us who are committed to the cause, it's like-minded people working together in unity to accomplish a common goal. Think about this for a moment. Today, I represent 300 people. Tomorrow, it will be 1,000. Didi and Catholic Charities represents thousands and thousands of people, and so do so many of you. Couple that with other local and national organizations that are involved in the fight, and we can impact entire cultures and societies to live right and make smart decisions. And finally, couple that with the spirit and the power of God propelling us in the battle. Organized religion that's man-made will never do the trick. Kingdom mentalities that are spirit-led by spirit-led people will transform a culture in every way, shape, and form. And then what happens? You have an army to be reckoned with because this is a very real war and a very real battle. I'm confident that if the organizations represented here today would band together as we move forward, that we can make a difference. And though rescuing the victim is vital, imagine a world where we prevent victims from ever being created. That's right. Okay? Thank you. Watch. This isn't about building our own kingdom or sinking another notch in our belt that screams, look at me, everybody. Look at my success. This is about one thing, and Jesus couldn't have said it any better when he said the following statement. Luke chapter 4, verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Today is the acceptable day of the Lord. 2013 is the acceptable year, and so will next year, and so on and so on. Let's commit to this battle individually, and let's commit corporately. I will and have made the decision to not look upon another woman in an unhealthy manner. I will make the decision, along with my family, to not support anything that promotes ungodliness in our home or society. I do this for my Heavenly Father, I do it for myself, I do it for my wife, and I do this for my 11-month-old daughter. I do this for you. I do this for our children. I am committed. Are you? Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Dave. Um, you guys couldn't see what I saw up here. He had his phone with a timer on it. And I thought if he finishes at exactly the right time, I am going to question if he's really a pastor. <laughs> But he stopped it at 57 seconds about four minutes ago. <laughs> yeah. So I can attest. Busted. He's the real thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. And we did talk yesterday um, very briefly. Um, he had shared a little bit about that um, idea of us being the gatekeepers. And I love that. We are to be the gatekeepers of our city. Um, and I think the church plays a very unique role in that the nature of our ministries and outreaches helps us to cross the path of those that are in um, great need. And we want to be able to meet that need. Um, and a lot of times there's some frustration because we can't always fix it. Um, God doesn't call us to fix it. He calls us to love them, to plant the seed. But still, we want to see healing take place. Um, 
four years ago, we had uh, Christine Kane come to our church and speak on um, human trafficking, and she has an organization, A21. Um, and we had the, the privilege of going to Thessaloniki, Greece, where their first shelter was built. And we learned a great deal um, there, got to talk with the, the survivors, and um, just made us really passionate about the cause, but not really understanding that it was right here in our backyard. And so we began to educate ourselves, bring awareness as much as we could as a church. But um, a little less than two years ago, Representative Todd hosted this same summit. And um, that was a turning point for us because we came together as a community and learned um, what was happening with the issue of human trafficking, but also right here in our own city. And I think that that was a real wake up call. It's not, it's not a new issue, but because we have identified it, um, it is, it's a new term and we, we didn't realize that this was happening. So from that summit, we, um, a great deal of us that I, I um, was able to talk with, we left here that day realizing that one of the greatest needs for our city was to have a shelter, a safe place for these victims. Um, we can um, rescue them, but if we don't have a place to take them so that they can go through the healing process, um, then we're not doing doing them any good um, and we spoke about that earlier uh, we want we want to help them so we had this passion to do this for our city but we knew that it was you know an insurmountable task it would be insurmountable but to look away would be irresponsible so in less than two years um, We've all been, I think, gathering information and networking with one another. We have um, been before law enforcement and city officials, and we have reached out to um, different organizations that are fighting the fight with us. We have um, gone outside of our state to say, you're doing a great job at this. Can you teach us how to do that? So um, with all of that, we have a wealth of knowledge and um, need the action that goes with it that we spoke about earlier. Um, I think that that's a very scary place to be whenever you want to take that step of faith, knowing that you want to do the right thing and you want to do it well and you don't want to cause more harm. But there comes a time that once you've gathered as much information as you can gather, knowing that the situation is always going to be changing, you're never going to have it all together because you're going to get the curveball. Knowing that, um, we believe as Bay Area Fellowship that it was time for us to step out and, and take action with the four years of knowledge that we had been given. So um, the last, last few months, um, Pastor Bill announced um, uh, to our church that we would be launching the Rescue House of South Texas. And it will be a um, short-term facility for adult women to come and um, spend time with us long enough, long enough for us to help transition her to a long-term facility where she can have um, healing, go into a restoration process or a reintegration process. Um, we took that step of faith and this last week we closed on the home and probably within the next several weeks we'll be able to open our doors and we are thrilled about that. But I have to tell you that the point that we are at now from two years ago uh, couldn't have taken place without the cooperation of many people in this room, without the cooperation of our community. Um, we have gone before our church family and said, these are the needs and they are great. And you have heard testimony this morning already, um, the amount of time it requires, the amount, amount of resources it requires. Um, and so being the gatekeepers of our city, I think that that is so beautiful because in order for any of us to do a drop-in shelter or a, a minor shelter, um, an adult shelter, uh, any kind of victim services, pouring into um, the victims, that's gonna require all of us. And it's gonna require that person that has an awareness because they saw something at the gas station all the way to that person that's providing services for them. Um, we are the gatekeepers of our city and I just love that. We are dedicated, dedicated to the cause because God tells us um, that we're to rescue the hurting, we're to rescue the needy, we're to rescue those that cannot help themselves and to be a voice for them. 
to be a voice for them because clearly they don't realize they're victims. So let's help them find their voice. Um, I have a, a precious friend who um, was a victim uh, from the age of six to 16. And in all of our fears of asking her about what, what do we do because I don't know, I don't know your life and I feel like such a, a fraud because I'm coming in trying to say that I'm gonna help you, I want to help you, but I honestly don't know where they've been or what, what, you know, what they've done, what their past has been like. And so how can I fully come along and say, I want to love you and help you and, and help you heal when I really don't know what that is. Um, and she said to me, your compassion is enough. And she said, if I had known when I was being abused that there was one person that was fighting for me, if there was one person that cared about me, I would have had hope and I might have been able to tolerate the pain a little bit more. And that changed my mentality. That changed my understanding of what each and every one of us can do. We do work together in every little effort that each one of us can make, makes a difference. It makes a difference for someone. Um, and I believe that um, as the gatekeepers of the city, that we have plenty of people in this room to do that. Plenty of people in this room. And so it is a mentality change so that we can change our culture. Um, but we have to be willing to open our eyes and really see, to really see so that we can identify. And I think the more we are um, educating and bringing awareness and doing that through um, all different kinds of venues, but, um, but the church the church plays a key role. We have ministries that have given us an in to relationships that we would not have had otherwise. And um, we have relationships with the girls in the strip clubs. We have relationships with the homeless. We have relationships with the annex. Um, those are all avenues that God has laid in place because of the nature of our ministry. And then we're able to build those relationships. So when they're ready, they can say, can you help me? So, um, so it is, it, it's key that we're all working together, doing what God's called us to do because he makes the big picture and then we see that lives are changed and we can stop, we can stop the slavery forever. I just pray that when my grandchildren and great grandchildren are grown, they will be reading about this in a history book but not understand um, from a personal experience what is happening in our society today. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Miss Carrie, um, but if you have any questions, we would love for you to visit the table in the back. If you have any questions at all about the rescue house, Pastor Bill and Jessica uh, may be walking around here. Feel free to grab them if you have questions for them. Um, we all know that, um, that the birth is painful, but it's when the baby gets here that all the hard work starts. So we could use your support. We would love for you to come by and just talk with us. So Miss Carrie. Um, my name is Carrie Thompson, and I'm the director of the Immigration Refugee Services at Catholic Charities of Corpus Christi. Um, I'm an attorney by trade, uh, but with the Immigration Refugee Assistance, you know, we, we end up doing more than just providing legal services. Um, sometimes, you know, we become counselors. I mean, I'm a counselor at law, but we actually do become actual counselors. Um, and so um, our program, obviously, as Kim said, we do Immigration Refugee Services, so um, we're obviously more focused on the international aspect, and um, in any way we possibly can, we do try to assist victims who have been um, uh, victims of trafficking. Um, but at Catholic Charities, in the the whole agency, we have nine departments, including the Mother Teresa Shelter, and included in those nine departments are um, programs that can really assist um, in a lot of different ways. We try to fill the needs so, sort of of things that fall through the cracks with other agencies. And we have an emergency aid program that provides, I, I actually sit across the hall from the person who does our emergency aid assistance. And she takes the most random, strange sort of needs and requests, and she manages a way to fill in that gap. Um, I was privy the other day to um, her talking to our executive director, Linda, and saying, okay, so we're gonna have the family go to the gas station, 
and then will fill up their tank of gas because all this family needed was to get home and they needed a tank of gas and so they came to Catholic Charities to do that and a lot of times when we're talking with the um, domestic victims of trafficking um, you know sometimes maybe they don't want to be reunited with a fi with family but we that's one of our goals always is to try to promote family reunification especially with our emergency aid program we really try to um, you know if it's a bus ticket um, if it's temporary shelter for a, a finite period of time we do try to help in that way so we have those programs available and you know sometimes we might not be able to help but I encourage you to always give us a call because you know we really like I said I sit across from her daily and I'm thinking oh wow okay I didn't know that <laughs> we did that and so um, she makes it her goal to try to help everybody in any means possible um, we also have an amazing counseling program um, we've had a counselor who's been at Catholic Charities for um, over 25 years and She's an amazing woman, and um, she has externs and interns that also work with her. And that counseling is offered on a, um, you know, on a, a sliding scale and at a very limited cost or no cost at all. And she's absolutely amazing. Um, so I just kind of wanted to highlight some of those um, some of those programs, and also just to kind of touch earlier um, with benefits for international victims of trafficking. And I, and um, you know. Uh, there are benefits available, and sometimes it can seem like possibly that, wow, that's a lot of benefits for, for international victims of trafficking, but there's not benefits available for domestic um, victims of trafficking. But um, for international victims of trafficking, unfortunately, you know, they probably don't know the language, and um, they won't actually have documentation that will allow them to get assistance in any of the traditional means that a U.S. citizen or a permanent resident would be able to access. I mean, unfortunately, many emergency um, shelters and programs, they're limited to providing services only to um, citizens of the United States or lawful permanent residents. So that's one of the reasons. I just kind of wanted to distinguish why there are some um, additional benefits, or it seems like there's additional benefits for international trafficking victims. And it's because they literally, they go from um, the abode of whoever has brought them into the country to nothing at all. And they don't know the language, and they don't have family anywhere near. And so those, those additional benefits that are provided to international victims of trafficking is really just to put them on par with, um, you know, a domestic person who has um, documentation, um, because they really won't have the means to get um, shelter or housing. So and they will not get immigration in general. You don't get documentation for at least four or five months. So you might be on the pathway to getting some sort of benefit, but you're not going to get the actual documentation that assists you for another six, ten, nine months to a year. So that's some of the reasons why there's additional benefits. Um, uh, but you know, as we came in here today, I sort of laughed. I'm like, I'm an attorney. I'm not. I'm not really a, a, a someone who preaches, but. Uh, um, <laughs> I mean, I do to my family and my husband, uh, but, you know, not typically uh, in general. And um, I wanted to start with two verses, and you chose the first one. I mean, I think that's an absolutely amazing verse. And I always think when Christ rolls up the scroll and he says, that's, that's fulfilled today, I think, yeah, way to go. You know, I mean, it's really, it provides me inspiration when I get down. And I think as we leave, this problem seems so big. And just to remember that, Christ is sending us forth to be his hands, his ears, his eyes. That's, that's who we are as Christians. And I think that's a phenomenal kind of legacy that we have is to be Christ's voice and hands and ears on this earth because if we don't do it, no one else will. And that's how we move hearts. Um, but to, and I'm just going to share this passage because I think everybody here, you're here today, so you're already familiar with it, but I love it. Um, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit upon his glorious throne, and all the nations will be assembled before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd, shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on the right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. A stranger, and you welcomed me. Naked, and you clothed me. Ill, and you cared for me. In prison, and you visited me. 
Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you ill or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, Amen, I say to you, when you did this for the least of my brothers, you did it for me. I think that's astounding. And what's astounding is the people he's talking about are not the pretty people. They're not the people who are easy to love. They're the ones who we do, like we were saying earlier, when we see them in the store or on the side of the street, we kind of want to turn our heads. They make us really uncomfortable. And um, that's who he's talking about. That's our legacy is to help those individuals. And I think that that is phenomenal. Um, to talk a little bit about um, our faith response to the issue of human trafficking is we obviously have the immediate services, but I think, um, especially with this panel, I think we've obviously hit on it, is that we want to make it that there's no never a victim again, that we are out of a job and that we don't need to be providing these services. And, um, you know, uh, the Pope Francis prepared a letter recently in preparation for World Migration Refugee Day, which occurs in January. And it was just interesting because he said, you know, when slavery is common coin in today's world, how is it that people still take those risks? Why are people still taking the risks that would put them um, in the hands of these traffickers and in this danger? And so our faith response is to determine what systemic issues are present in society that are creating this? Mm -hmm. From my experience, the things that create um, these victims is a lack of a strong family, but it's also, it's poverty, it's economic inequity, it's discrimination, it's lack of education, and frankly, a great indifference mm -hmm. from all of us right. to our sister and brother. Um, and so those are the root causes, and we need to try to discover how do we systemically change that. And so um, we do a lot of advocacy in addition to our direct services. And so, um, you know, when the trafficking bills came into place, we, um, through um, the Texas Catholic Conference, we actually will um, speak with representatives and senators to try to have some voice in how those are coined and penned. Um, an issue currently, which um, I I know that for a lot of this group, the it's uh, the it's, the focus is on a lot of um, domestic trafficking, which is which is huge. Um, but currently, within our Congress, there's a bill for comprehensive immigration reform, and um, the church supports the comprehensive immigration reform. And one of the reasons being is because the current immigration system, um, and, and once you work in the field of immigration law, you see how inconsistent the regulations are, how nonsensical it actually works. And it actually creates, it almost creates this fertile ground for, um, for trafficking to occur. And um, thousands of dollars are paid to people who might pay to be smuggled, but on the course of the journey, it turns into trafficking. So they, they no longer are just getting brought to the United States. It becomes um, they're, you know, they're having to, to do additional things. And so um, the current state of our immigration uh, laws has made it a fertile ground. And so the comprehensive immigration reform, one of the, one of the proponents outside of it just being just and compassionate, is also that at a common sense level, if we can um, document nonviolent offenders whose only crime has been to come into the country illegally, who have no other pathway to residency, then we can focus on traffickers and people, you know, using our highways um, to, uh, to engage in this type of business. So one of our huge, I think, um, one of our greatest uh, abilities is that we can advocate and everybody in this room can advocate and whether or not you agree with comprehensive immigration reform that's just an example um, we can all be advocates for our brothers and sisters and I think that that's the key is that um, human beings are more valuable than things and human beings are every single person on this earth who is creating God's image legal illegal black white Christian Muslim um, and we need to value each other as human beings. And so when we're enacting laws, we need to think 
maybe my brother and sister made a mistake, but how do I help um, remedy the problem now and um, start taking this divisive language out of the conversation? You know, takers, doers. You know, we're we're all just struggling to be as wonderful or as good as we can be, and um, you know, I just think that. We're all a part of the solution, and every single choice we make every single day, um, when we choose to love people and forgive, we we change the world. You know, I mean, maybe it's not uh, maybe it's not getting in the trenches. I mean, I think that not all of us will leave here today and say, "I'm going to," you know, go in there and do counseling or do some specific things, but just sharing, you know, just sharing the, the knowledge and being compassionate and being a witness um, to justice is an amazing thing. And I think that um, as Christians, that's just phenomenal. And that's all I have to share today, <laughs> but thank you. Two, okay, thank you, Carrie. Um, does anybody have any questions that Pastor Dave can answer? <laughs> oh, that's good. Okay. Short term is. Um, Yes, sir. Um, she asked if um, what we said our facility was going to be a short-term facility, so she was asking um, what exactly that meant. Um, the rescue house for us, um, we're taking small steps, and so for us what we feel like we can do right now is provide a short-term facility where we can help these girls that um, need help that will come to us and um, depending on what their situation is, if it takes five days to ten days, we will um, assess their situation and um, then help them um, get to a long-term facility, which would then be a restoration or reintegration program that would maybe be nine months or 12 months. So we're basically a transition home. We're gonna get them to safety, but then we're gonna help them get somewhere where they can have a long-term healing, where they do have counseling services, where they do have therapy, where all of those things are provided for them. So basically we're kind of a middleman we're going we're gonna to get them because we're in our city, but then we are partnering with people in our city and around um, that we can transport them to get them into a long-term home. Yes, ma'am. Oh, oh, good. She asked if I would make my presentation available to the public, um, and of course I'd love to, and I'm not exactly sure the best way to get it to everybody. Uh, we're a brand new church, so I would uh, hate to tell you I'm going to put it up on the website and it doesn't happen. Is it possible to give it, to have it emailed out? I'm, I'm happy to email it to anybody that would like to have it. Um, is there a way to... Have I can get it maybe to you or your organization, you could send it out possibly? If you'll get it to me, uh, everybody, we're going to have a, if you've signed up on the email, we'll get it to you. So I'll email it right away today to uh, State Representative Hunter, and then I'll make, and then he can send it out to everybody that would like to have it. And thank you. I appreciate that. Well, I want to thank this panel. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Now, at this time, I'm going to turn over the introduction to a good friend. Marlene, come on up here. Marlene Virial and I have been, I guess, on the talking circuit together. And uh, I see Ms. Sizemore back there, too. Uh, I want to applaud you two. These two ladies came to me early on when they were dealing with the issue of human trafficking. And they have a passion like I do. But they formed a group, Blue Nation, 
and Marlene has been speaking the word. And one of the things we're doing here today is trying to get the word out. It's real. Now, I just want you to know we appreciate what you've done. And I do want you to know that we do have folks that care. We have over 350 people today, yes. ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. And I also want to thank, which is shock, the media. Uh, we appreciate the coverage. We have newspaper here. We have our TV stations here. Yeah. So we appreciate. And the message, no matter what you cover, is to get the word out. This is real. It needs to be stopped. So thank you for being here, media. And in the back, over by Dr. Gloria Scott right over there, is Representative J.M. Lozano showed up here. So we appreciate you coming here, J.M. So at this time, Marlene, I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce our keynote. I need to make this one. I have to put my lawyer hat on now. See, the worst thing you've got for me is I was once public official. Put that hat on. I've just taken off now. Put a lawyer. You got double dose. <laughs> our survivor. I can tell you, it's a rarity to have a survivor talk. I uh, was in legislative hearings along with Angie and Jennifer, and we heard one. But today, it is such a constructive message. She has agreed to take questions. She has agreed for the media to cover, which is rare. We have the program block between now and 1.30. I'm going to turn it over to Marlene and her. But I want you to know, generally, our survivors don't provide that much access. And so, Marlene, thank you for setting this up. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Hunter. Um, I think it's really important to hear the aspect. What you heard today so far has been legal definition what we have in our community, what we still need in our community, what victims look like, what victims go through. It's very rare that you get a firsthand account of what that looks like. And um, this young lady, we met her last year. Um, every year we do hold a symposium during Human Trafficking Awareness Week. This week it'll be in April. Um, last year it was at Del Mar, where we bring in speakers from around the state to address this issue, and she was introduced to us. Um, I met with her. Um, we've built a relationship. We are continuing to build that relationship. She's an amazing woman. And when we talk about human trafficking, it's always a very dark subject and horrific and an atrocity, but it's an also a story of hope and of empowerment and of restoration. And that's what um, our speaker is going to impart to us today, is yes, at one point she was victimized, but she is no longer a victim. She has moved beyond that and is a survivor. And I believe, and we talked about this this morning, she's a leader. She's a leader in her own community. She's a leader in the faith community. She's a leader in my life. I cannot imagine. We're opening a drop-in center, and I do not have a survivor that I can go to and say, what do you think about this? What do you? I did not have. She's graciously agreed to work alongside with us and give me her input because, as I think Dee Dee shared earlier, the last thing you want to do is re-victimize or re-hurt someone so she has agreed to graciously come alongside of us and work with our programming hand to hand so I can get an account of what that looks like and how it'll benefit um, victims in our community. So I love her dearly. I love her more every time that I speak with her. She's amazing and I am honored and blessed to introduce Rebecca Charleston.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much. First of all, I just wanted to start and say, I apologize in advance for all the, or for all the coughing I've done. And my voice sounds a little rough, but um, I'm glad to be here today. I was so amazed when I walked in earlier this morning and I saw our state representative starting in prayer. How neat that was to walk in at that moment, because I didn't expect that at this conference at all. And um, I just want to also thank Marlene and Blue, uh, Blue Nation for getting me here. So um, for all of you that don't know me yet, um, I'm Rebecca Charleston, and I am a overcomer of domestic minor sex trafficking. I was uh, in the life, if you will, for more than a decade. I started at age 17. So I just want to share a little bit of my story today and bring up some points of things I've learned uh, along my path of healing that I'd like to point out. I just want to give a voice, a face to what this is that you are all coming together to help abolish. Um, it's really hard because every most people have the I, misperception of what it looks like, and you think you've seen the movie Taken, and oh, I want to get involved, and that's not what happens in America. That's not how it looks usually. And it can look like me, just like that gentleman said. It could be my daughter. Well, I'm here to say I am your daughter. Um, I came from a home, uh, a Christian family. My parents have been married 50 years in January. I'm the youngest of six children. None of my other uh, brothers and sisters ever had anything like this happen to them. Um, so vulnerability isn't defined by what we look like, our social status, economics. Um, it's, it's a mindset and a, maybe a set of decisions that have been made in that individual's life. And a lot of them, it stems from bad decisions, but vulnerable youth um, is, is what we all need to concentrate on. So I'd like to know, it, it didn't seem like there was that many law enforcement here earlier, it, just really a couple. Any in the medical industry? Okay, so a lot of nonprofit and NGOs, it seems like. Um, when something someone touched on earlier was not identifying as a victim, and I've been out for a little over four years now, and it just, it took me about two years until I finally saw that I was a victim, until I finally realized what happened to me, because I had no clue. I mean, I just thought I had a really bad life. <laughs> I didn't think, I mean, I, I knew I was prostituted. Um, I, I just did not connect the dots. I would have never seen myself as a victim. I really thought it was my choice, and that's some, uh, something I still struggle with in my mind. Um, when I was growing up, I was the definition of a wild child. <laughs> uh, rebellious spirit, fiercely independent. As the baby, I didn't want anyone to do anything for me. I wanted to choose what to do. And I usually chose the hard way. I'm not sure why. <laughs> but um, I started using drugs recreationally. And um, actually, my parents <clears throat> got to a point, someone said earlier about um, not caring, saying that I can't deal with you anymore. And they pushed me out of the house. And that's what happened. I was 16 years old, and I decided to go live on my own. Still trying to go to high school. Doesn't work very well. And um, <clears throat> that was kind of my real, where my real vulnerability started kicking in. Um, my parents did try to come back and save me, rescue me, the only way that they knew how, which was by coming and getting me and putting me in an institution. They put me in an all-girl all -girl Christian home um, in East Texas, and I stayed there for about six months, and then I ran. And from that point in my life, I did not look back. I discontinued any connection with my family that I had because I felt like what they had done was the ultimate betrayal to me. I thought I was fine before, and here they plucked me out of my life and put me in prison, basically. And um, to me, going back to my family was not an option. That was like, might as well just kill myself. That's how I felt about it. And I'm still 17 at this point, and so, from that moment, I just started living with whoever I met with that day. I liked somebody earlier coined the phrase, a one-day boyfriend, and that's exactly what it was. 
I would meet someone and literally go get my trash bags that I had, because that's what I carried my stuff in, and be living with them that next day or that night. Um, I, I just live like a homeless person. I let anybody do anything to me. I put anything in my body. And I, I thought I was living the life. <laughs> um, it didn't take long before uh, I found myself living with some drug dealers. And I, let me just tell you, the 17-year-old girl that I'm talking about looks nothing like the woman that you see today. Um, night and day difference, the restoration that God has provided me. So... Uh, I found myself living with some drug dealers, and business got slow. So another girl that was living in the house uh, talked me into going to a strip club to dance because we needed to pull our own weight since they had been providing for us all along, and now their business was slow. Well, we needed to help out. Sounded reasonable enough to me. And so here I am, 17, working in a strip club that provides alcohol. So we all know that's 21 and up. Got, Got hired easily, no problem sat on the laps of 30 and 40 year old men where they bought me drinks. Um, No one did anything. Uh, It didn't take long for working in the club uh, that I met a pimp. And mind you, the only time I'd ever really heard the word pimp outside of, oh, that's pimp in high school, um, someone said that they'll beat you and take all their money. You want to make sure you never go with a pimp. So I had a vision in my mind, like on TV, you know, with someone with a big hat and a cane, and that sounds terrible. I'd never go with that guy. <laughs> well, let me just tell you, that's not what they really look like. That's not how they present themselves. They don't come up to you and say, hey, you're going to do this for me. It, there is a grooming period that takes place. And um, my situation was always a Romeo-type situation where I thought, this is my father figure. This is, you know, we're in love now, and we're, we're doing stuff for each other, and uh, it was a team. <clears throat> so just a couple weeks, maybe a month, of working in that strip club, and this guy says, hey, why don't you go home with me? I have no idea why I did, but I did, and slept at his house. And then the next, next night, uh, after sleeping all day, being high, He said, hey, go with these two girls, and they're going to show you the ropes. Well, okay. So I did, and uh, I found myself on Harry Hines Boulevard in the backseat of a car, not knowing what to do. And these girls were telling me the ropes, (laughs) telling me what was going to take place and, you know, what I needed to say and how I needed to act. And I had no clue what to do. Uh, My choices pretty much were... I don't know if any of you have ever been to Dallas and Harry Hines Boulevard, but it's a pretty scary place even in the daytime for an adult, much less a 17-year-old at nighttime. Um, My choices were either say, screw it, deal with it, or try to run and probably get murdered. So I chose to deal with it. And I was in that situation for about two months. And then I met another individual who, of course, you know, didn't, didn't advertise who he was or what he was. And uh, I was really about ready to kill myself in that situation. I knew I, w- I was actually ready to give up and go home, but I thought, you know what, this guy seems really nice. You know, let me just give him a chance. And if it doesn't work out, then, you know, may- maybe I'll just give up. So uh, this guy had a 5,000 square foot home. This guy had multiple cars. He had businesses. He had other women that answered his phone that he called his secretary. Wow, I'd never been around stuff like that before. I'm um, from a very modest, middle-class family. I'd never seen a house that big. And um, he didn't ask me to do anything for him. I sat around his house for months while he groomed me and waited until I turned 18 since he was 20 years older than me. And he started the brainwashing slowly. And when you hear the word brainwashing, you probably think, do-do-do, do-do-do, <laughs> you know, that they're just putting a magic spell on you. And that's not how it is. It's just every single day being reinforced, hearing the same things. Um, I like to use an analogy of Stalin or Hitler. And, I mean, entire nations have been brainwashed and hypnotized to think a different way. Stalin came in, and he removed 
all evidence of any person before him, any leader before him, so that the people felt like he was it. Well, if, uh, if that could happen to a whole country, how much, how much more one vulnerable girl or boy? So um, trafficker, pimp, whatever word you want to use, they study you. They take the time to learn what makes you tick, why you ran away from home, whatever that situation may be, what it is that they can get you excited about, and they sell you a dream. They sell you of what it's gonna be like in the future, and they give you a reason to devote your body, your time, all your money, everything to them. Now, there is different trafficking situations, let me just stop and say that. Some of them, women are kept in cages, you know, women or men are kept in cages. Um, There's so many different faces of trafficking, it does not discriminate at all. So all I can do is really share my story, and there's a lot of people that are similar to mine and what my experiences are. So um, one of the big things, I I stayed with that trafficker, let me get back to my story, for um, just under 10 years. Um, I had Bentleys, I had Rolls Royces, I had houses all over the country. None of it was mine. Um, I got beat, not on a daily basis, but pretty often. I was verbally and emotionally abused every single day, every single minute. The manipulation and control that traffickers use over their victims, keeping you awake at night. I don't know how many of you have ever gone through a work week where you're exhausted, just like Mr. Hunter was saying, and you can barely think straight. Well, think about that over months and years where someone is purposely not letting you sleep. They're getting angry at you before you go to sleep, so you can't sleep. Um, Just a number of different tactics that they use to control you. And then people look at us and think, well, why didn't she just choose to leave? Well, I can barely choose to put my shoes on, much less think about getting out of a situation. You're not thinking rationally. Um, So the beginning to the end of my situation um, the f- uh, federal, we were living here in Texas, and the law enforcement, federal law enforcement came in and raided our home, and they came and tried to attack us like we were all criminals. They did not have a victim-centered approach. There was no talk of trafficking. They were trying to prove prostitution ring, things like that. And um, From day one, my trafficker instilled in all of us, he beat into us. A chain is only as strong as its weakest link, that we had to stick together, that the law enforcement was out to get us, everybody was out to get us. I pushed everyone in my life out, because that's what he had me do. From the very beginning, he taught me he was the only one that loved me, that no one else cared about me, Nobody else would want me. If anybody else knew anything about me, they would immediately call me a whore and never accept me. So that just creates in you a fear even about stepping out or talking about your situation because this has been told to you for an extended period of time. Um, He told me, I don't know how many times, that he would kill me if I ever left him, and I believed him. I've been beaten so bad, bruises all over my body. Why wouldn't I believe him that he'd kill me if I left him? So I think that's a big thing that uh, people struggle with is why the girls choose to stay. And it's when you're already vulnerable, you're in a space where it's pretty easy to be manipulated by other people, especially people who that's their sole intention. And then they can use force, fraud, and coercion to keep you there and keep you going. So um, what everyone's doing here is really neat in my opinion. It's like building all these little bridges, little pieces of bridges that over time, people can walk over that bridge. But if it's just one person trying to build the bridge, that's like a rail. You can't walk over that. It takes everybody. And um, a little bit about getting out and how it feels like leaving um, well, let me let me backtrack again. The only reason that I was able to leave is 
uh, the FBI came in, they raided our homes, nothing came of that immediately, it took another year or so, and then they came and arrested me in Las Vegas, because I was the youngest in the uh, organization or family, if you will, and they figured that I would tell, I assume. So they came and arrested me, and they got a big surprise when I gave them a big no thank you, <laughs> for lack of better words. <laughs> Um, so they wound up extraditing me uh, all the way back here to Texas since I was in Nevada and they would not let me out and um, I flew on Con Air all the way back here and they kept me in until they finally sentenced me well since no one in the organization would talk because we were all deathly afraid of him and what he would do because we knew if he got some kind of pandering charge what he'd maybe get a year at the most if that, so that's not really enough time to get away from someone like this that's controlled your whole life. The other two girls in this situation, uh, one was there for 20 years and the other was there for 25 years. So that's a lot of abuse and a lot of mindsets that are really hard to get around. So um, I finally got sentenced and this whole time I was in jail, it was a neat experience because I was able to be away from my trafficker and I didn't have him mad at me all the time or you know yelling at me cussing at me because when we did talk on the phone it was recorded so of course he was very careful <laughs> what he said to me so and um, that kind of started letting me see a different side of life because I had accepted life as it was and um, when I was released on supervised release I had three years and they would not let me move back to Nevada again an amazing intervention that um, allowed me to continue to stay away from him because the entire time in prison he promised me everything that ever that I had ever wanted I wanted to have a baby I wanted to retire I didn't want to work anymore I didn't want to go out at night and sell myself and I wanted to have a baby and he promised me the entire time I was in there that that would happen uh, as soon as I got out that would happen so I stayed faithful I never never told never gave any hint of anything so when I got out I realized that wasn't the truth. The situation was still basically the same. And matter of fact, actually things were really horrible since I'd been gone, since I was a top breadwinner. I'd been gone for a year. So I, when I got out of prison, all I could do was cry, which is really funny. You'd think I'd be happy that I was out of prison. But um, through that course, I started to become my own individual. I started to make friends. I started to let people in just a little bit um, that I wouldn't have if I was living in the same state as him. And then it came time for him to go to prison. So he got sentenced to a little bit longer. He got 18 months for a mitigating role. And it was about a month after he went to prison that I realized that I was going to leave him. And from that time, it took me a whole nother month of agonizing physical pain, um, GI problems, everything, every single day as I agonized over the decision to leave him while he was in prison. That's how scared I was still. And all I was going to do was write him an email and say, I'm leaving. <laughs> so I finally got the courage, and I did it. And um, I wish I would have turned to God at that point in my life. And I, I could tell you that my story ended there, but it didn't. Um, I decided to try to do it on my own. And I didn't even think about God. And of course, I was raised in church. I knew who he was. But there was a lot of rules that went with that, in my opinion. Uh, I, I wasn't raised to have a relationship. I was raised to follow rules. So I wound up getting addicted to drugs. I thought, well, I did all of this work for him. I could do it for myself and keep the money now. Why not? That's a great idea. Doesn't really work that way. <laughs> when you don't have someone standing behind your uh, back, breathing on your neck to go out there and do those things, you don't really, it's not something that you really want to do for yourself. <laughs> so the drive is gone. So um, I kind of floundered and I've kind of gone from a dysfunctional relationship to another. It's still hard. I'm still walking it out. But um, finally, I found myself, I was living back in Nevada, um, not in the business or anything, had a boyfriend um, that I thought was a good guy, and um, found myself pregnant. And when I was about four months pregnant, I really started feeling like I needed to go home, that God was calling me home, and I felt like I needed to pray for the first time in a long time. And um, so I didn't know how I was going to get home because he had all the money. So I wound up, God just worked it out. It was just a total God thing. And I wound up coming back home to Texas, four months pregnant with 
nothing. And the amount of healing and restoration and what God has provided for me in these last two years is beyond words. Um, I realized I was able to identify finally as a victim, identify what happened to me and actually come to grips with a a 17 year old girl that means a 37 year old man out who is only out to manipulate and control them. That wasn't really my choice. He used me. And that's a really hard thing to admit for us because that's admitting that someone else just totally controlled you and manipulated you. That makes you feel pretty stupid. We don't like to admit when we're stupid, right? <laughs> when we make bad decisions. So um, really come into grips with that. It, it's been incredible to find faith-based organizations like We Are Cherished um, in Dallas. That was really the first organization where it was all these church ladies that help girls that work in the industry, and that blew my mind because I thought, wow, I thought they would just be judging me. My own church, Gateway in um, South Lake. I walked in pregnant, said I'm alone. I figured everyone would shun me and no one would talk to me. They actually have Embrace Grace, which is a single pregnant girls program. So just incredible. They gave me everything I needed for my baby. Um, just since I've decided to involve God, he's always been involved, but I just chose to ignore him. Uh, leaps and bounds have been made in my recovery. Um, and I know someone was asking earlier about what can you do and how are we changing the mindset, what's being done to change that. And I just would like to challenge you because um, there's a phenomenon going on that probably none of you know anything about, that men are buying sex, men are buying dances for their sons, for their 18th birthdays, for their 16th birthdays, whatever it may be. This is going on right under your noses. This is our... Our men are training our young boys to become part of the demand. And that needs to change. That's a great way to start changing, is to educate our youth that you respect women, that you don't objectify them and exploit them. Um, I, I've, had, I've run into that exact scenario, a man and a son, anywhere from hotel rooms to brothels to strip clubs, any avenue that I've been in, I've seen that. And these are normal-looking people. It's not... I mean, obviously they have money, they're there, so. Um, I also <clears throat> wanted to go back now to when getting out and um, a counselor at a recent conference that I was at described it like spiraling. So you're going around as you're moving forward. So constantly I'm falling back, but I'm getting up, I'm going back around and I'm, I am moving forward, but it's just slowly. And um, that's exactly what it's like. Uh, that's why it's such a high rate of relapse is it's really hard to normalize yourself because it dealing with that complex trauma it's different from PTSD while it while it does include that the complex trauma is you know something that happens to you every single day for an extended period of time you know people can get PTSD from an explosion or from a typhoon that hits, um, but when it's something that you're having to shut your body off and go into survival mode every single day and be raped, abused uh, in any way, shape, or form every day, that's, it's a whole different type of trauma that you're dealing with. So healing it makes it, healing from it makes it that much harder. Also, um, just like walking on a tightrope, and think about your walking on a tightrope. And you're spiraling at the same time, trying to stay on it. And it's so easy to fall off until you meet people like Marlene or like Minta. And they help you build another board along that bridge. And eventually it gets wide enough to where now you're finally on solid ground. And I just want to commend you all for being here because you are making a difference. You're making a change even just by being here. Um, there is a lot of tools that I'm not going to really educate you guys on, but the key words like motivational interviewing and trauma-informed care, those are, are very, um, I would say, cutting-edge things that if you're going to be working with victims, those are things that you definitely need to look into, Google, find out about it, um, and how to treat us. And for the law enforcement, um, I just I really commend you for being here because I know how I treated law enforcement, and it was terrible because they treated me terrible. When I was in the life, and I, uh, I can't tell you how many times I've been arrested. I have no clue. Um, they, 
either, especially mainly I was arrested in Las Vegas on prostitution charges and they treat you like a dog. Um, and that's how they look at you. And you might get the nice one occasionally that patronizes you and says, oh, you're too pretty for this. Don't ever say that to a survivor. That hurts more than someone being mean. <laughs> so, um, but <clears throat> for law enforcement, they have a really tough job cut out for them because we don't identify ourselves as victims. And they come into a situation and they're, they're breaking up a happy home, even though it's not very happy. They are... Uh, messing with people's incomes. Um, it, it's not a pleasant situation when they come in. And that's why it's so great if they partner with NGOs and stuff. So they have people that know how to talk to us because a lot of times, you know, I would maybe say something to someone from an NGO or anyone that's not a police basically that would get me to open up before I would interview with a police officer just because in the life you're you were taught you're, everything is against the police, so. Um. I would like to call some attention too to the ancillary facilities that allow trafficking. This is something that I'm really passionate about. Um, when I was on Harry Hines Boulevard and I was renting hotel rooms for an hour, going in with people, looking very young, going in with people, buying condoms at the front desk, What's happening to these businesses? What, I, w I would like to see a push to see those businesses get a little bit of law enforcement attention, or a little bit of attention from the media. Why are they allowing that? They know exactly what is going on in the facility, just like that nail salon that was brought up. Um, just some attention to those facilities would, would be great because people see us. People see the victims in everyday life. And um, like Dennis had said earlier, he now, since he's been around it so long, he recognizes it. I can spot it a mile away. It's really hard for you guys to spot it, but just keeping your eyes open and questioning things that you do see, um, especially if it's you know 17-year-old girls coming 10 times a night to the same hotel to rent a hotel room. You know, that's pretty obvious something's going on there. Um, my worth used to be defined in how much money I made every night. That was my worth. Sometimes it was a lot. $30,000, $60,000, sometimes it was nothing. And now, since I've been fully restored and I moved back, I know that my worth is the blood of Jesus Christ, and that is totally restored me and made all the difference in the world in dealing with the trauma, definitely. Hmm. I guess I kind of really generalized my story. Uh, I really wanted to have time for questions from you guys, if you have any questions about my story at all or about any part of it. I'd, be, I'd love to entertain them. Mm -hmm. I had a question earlier about I had the question earlier about proactive actions that could be done because everything we've heard here, to, uh, most of everything we heard here, was reactive mm -hmm. actions. So what do we do to restore? And uh, my question earlier was about what can we do to prevent? And of course, I'm a, I'm a very strong constitutionalist, so I object to those things that are going to impinge our freedom. Mm -hmm. Uh, First Amendment freedoms, all the various freedoms in the Constitution. And I look around and I think one of the things that drives the male culture that you were talking about, the father-son thing, one of the things that drives that is Hollywood. Mm -hmm. In fact, 90% of it is Hollywood, in my opinion. You don't see that as much on TV anymore. That's changed a lot recently. But t uh, movies still do it. And I don't know how you solve that problem without trampling on f freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing that we can all do specifically is uh, educating our youth, um, not, not creating throwaway kids, as was called. Um, you know, my parents let me move out. You know, they, I ran away. No one filed a report on me. The National Center for Missing and Exploited Youth, um, those foster kids that run away, people don't go looking for them. They're just gone. So we're just letting a large factor of our youth go, which it, it which that, 
they then in turn become that vulnerable youth that we're talking about. But also then attacking the demand, you know, getting groups in your church together to educate young men on how to treat women and how to what value to attach to them so that we can hopefully attack it from both sides. And as far as the movies are concerned, I mean, we're, we all just have to do our part and not go and not not go choose to watch movies that promote uh, purchasing prostitution, that promote strip clubs, that promote other things like that. It's one day at a time. If they if it's not making money, then they won't make them. So, yes, sir. You, you said that it would uh, anger you or bother you when they would tell you you're too pretty for this. What would you encourage law enforcement to say in that situation? Because that's a key moment to plant a seed or to call the person out of that lifestyle. Is there something you'd recommend that they do say or address while they're in custody? Well, that's um, studying that victim-centered approach and the trauma-informed care because usually it comes you're meeting head on. And there is no, um, I'm, I'm coming at you like you're a victim. At least that was my experience. Now some law enforcement are a little more educated on what to look for and what that situation might be. And maybe they're treating those women differently. Um, <clears throat> I think just a different approach. And there's a lot of buzzwords, especially I, I wanted to touch on not trying to act tougher when you're dealing with victims than you are. Because uh, some of the lingo, like Dennis mentioned earlier, you know, the slang that we use in that lifestyle, when we hear other people use it, it just creates instant disrespect because you have no idea in our minds what you're talking about and you just proved it because maybe you didn't use the word right or maybe you just don't look cool enough saying it. <laughs> but <clears throat> so realizing, realizing that you... Uh, no matter how close you get to it, you still don't know what they went through. And to not make those generalizations like that, to not use words like rescue or I'm going to save you because I don't think I need to be saved. I didn't think I needed to be rescued. It took me finally educate, being educated on my own to even identify as a victim. So, yes, sir. First of all, I want to thank you, Rebecca. What you're doing for many people is tremendous, and we thank you for it so much. Now, my question, I have two, two questions. Have you ever had a book written about your experiences in your life? It's something in the works right now that I'm, um, I'm in school full time right now. Actually, I actually haven't even gone over what's going on in my life, but um, it definitely something okay. I would like to do. I was hoping so. And the other thing uh, is that um, I talked to Chairman Hunter about this and, and Brett Chesney about an idea. And that is actually doing a film, a motion picture, a feature film relatively to your life as well as other people in this mm -hmm. to make it people aware of what's going on. Because yes, there's 350 people here. Mm -hmm but we need to magnify that by the millions yes. to curb this blight on our society. It is a blight that, uh, that goes on, that people are picked up off the streets, young children, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we need to, we need to stop it, period. So I commend you and thank you so much for your uh, your wonderful uh, testimony. Well, thank and you. I thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I would love to be involved with any project, whether it just be a consultation or, or whatnot. Um, a huge part I left out is what's happened in my life since I've come home. I said that I decided to give my life back to God, but um, I now have a 17-month-old son. He's incredible. <laughs> and... <clears throat> And I decided to go back to school. Um, I was a dropout, as you can imagine. The only reason I got my GED is because the prison forced me to while I was in there. So I um, decided to go back to college. And I've gone, I'm a sophomore now, and I have a 4.0 GPA. 
Um, um, all the programs that have helped me, I've been able to turn around and now become a volunteer at those programs. And I was invited to Sharing the Hope in Washington, D.C., which is where they release a nation's report card on how the states are stacking up uh, fighting this issue. And that was such an honor. So that's why it's such a huge deal for survivors to be able to come and when we're ready to be able to talk about it because helping other people heals me. And it helps me work through my issues that I maybe still have that I don't know about. You know, it, it brings them to the surface. So, yes. Um, I don't know if you said it, but I missed it. Where are you currently staying? In the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um, what I believe your name is Jim, sir, correct? What Jim is still trying, and I've heard him say it already many times, and I've heard him say it throughout the morning and the day, is that he still wants to define awareness. What I have come to find in Corpus Christi is that if it isn't in my face or my family, it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. It is something international. It doesn't happen in the States. And the thing is, even when it does happen, everybody's still you know, kind of the um, turn my face the other way. So to answer Jim's question is the biggest thing here in um, Corpus and Nueces County that I have come to find out is that is amazing that Bay Area is one is, um, and, and Blue Night Nation are pulling out amazing um, organizations and, and housings for these wonderful women um, and my beautiful sisters with swords, um, is that the awareness is still not there. Mm -hmm. So to go back to Jim's question and to have a better um, understanding is that what are we as the city of body of Christ, Corpus Christi, are willing to do as local Americans for our community, our future, in whether you're in a small position or a little position, there's no position any smaller or bigger, because we are all a masterpiece for God's creation of his future um, you know, kingdom for us. And the thing is, are we willing to just ignore it whether we have money or we don't or are we willing to stand up and unite and make it really known and say you know what we're not going to turn our face in our cheek the other way that's the question is that are we going to go quietly or are we going to go out with a bang and the thing is that you know i didn't think i was going to be able to be here today but i thank god for it because i've learned a lot but the thing is that overall the awareness whether we put it out on TV, whether we make it more, not just one billboard, we make it every billboard, we put stickers, we put, you know, the, you know, more education, um, helping our mayor, helping our, you know, instead of complaining so much as far as watching the TV and watching our polls and our, you know, what's going to happen, are we willing to stand up front line and stand together and unite is the question. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, once we decide to do that, that's when we can break the chains. Mm -hmm. And the awareness is 100% going to be spoken out there. Definitely. And and things like this, like I, I'm doing my part. I'm helping educate. Just like all of you will hopefully go tell two or three people. And this will exponentially grow if we all just tell a few people. Um, 350 people, it's instantly multiplied to 700, 1,500. So... Uh, creating the education because it, it's not a new thing. I mean, prostitution, as they say, is the, the oldest business in the world. Um, nothing is new about it, but we're just now realizing what is actually happening behind these closed doors because we're finally able to come out and say it. Um, we're not being looked at as criminals now. We're being looked at and realize that, no, we, we're actually victims of our circumstances. And um, just education, yeah. Yes. I want to address your question, and um, you may not realize this, but on the federal level, there are obscenity laws that are on the books of our federal government that are not being enforced. And it does not impede the First Amendment right, but it does impede things like hardcore pornography, which truly feeds this industry. And until we address that sort of thing, it's really hard to get at the demand because we are feeding the need through that. So I, that's what I wanted mm -hmm. to say. Yes, ma'am.
<laughs> Kicking me off already, are you? <laughs> but I just wanted to also call some attention real quickly. I'll call some attention then ask you. Um, the aftercare services are so important because right now I'm you know, doing all my core credits to apply for my program and here I have felony tax evasion on my record because that's the only thing they could charge me with since I didn't tell. And I have countless prostitution charges. And I have no idea if I'll ever even be able to get licensed. So um, just the care about getting our records expunged, um, changing the laws uh, is, a, is a huge part that's going on. And it's really neat to see all that take place. Our state, I'm not sure if you're aware, I believe is a B. Yeah, we have a high B. Uh, and there's, there's some, still some Fs in our country, so a B is doing really good. There's only three A's, and we're probably going to be the next one. <laughs> so, yes, sir. Sorry. He was actually waiting. Um, I think, you know, waiting until a point when the victim is ready, because that you're right, that is a very difficult thing to go through, and um, I've still yet to put my trafficker in prison, but um, actually, one girl that came into our scenario, she was there for about three years and left, and she was trafficked as well, and um, I connected with her after I finally left and apologized to her for my part and what helped keep her in, in the life. And since then, um, even since then, the girl that was there for 25 years contacted me, and I was able to get her away from the trafficker. So um, even though just now, like, I, I'm finally now to the point where I'm really ready to share my story and maybe ready to put that man in prison because he's still out there. Um, so it, it takes a, a long time, and a lot of us aren't very good witnesses because we've been so damaged by all the trauma. And it's very hard when you live the life we live because – there's, there's periods in my life, especially when I was living, excuse me, um, pretty, like, pretty much like a homeless person, uh, well, I just don't remember because of the drug use. There's just black holes there. And I know we do become really tough witnesses in our own trials because maybe the story seems inconsistent or whatnot. Um, <clears throat> so my encouragement would just be waiting until the girl is ready and uh, – using the NGOs and the, the church organizations to help, help them in their healing and restoration process. And, and it has to be when they're ready. Yeah. Training, proper training for law enforcement on how to interview the victims. And yes. you know, you, your, the way you interview your typical suspects is very different than the way you're going to interview a possible victim of trafficking. And in order for them to become a good witness for you, is really going to start at that point of interview. Because of. Well, and, and the, the motivational about, interviewing. It's about mm -hmm. rapport building. So the interview with the victim is going to look a whole lot different than an interview with a potential drug user. Let, let me, y'all, it's a good discussion, but <laughs> nobody can hear you. Oh, because sorry. They can only hear you from the microphone. Yeah. And we have this being streamed. I uh, got you. And we have the other room. So mm -hmm. if you all could just do yeah. the microphone. Let me just ask real quick from a church perspective. So is Pastor Robert's church is where you're going, Gateway? I love him. He's a great friend. Awesome. Um, 
I, I can't wait to text him in a minute and just tell him how proud he should be. And so, uh, but I have the whole staff praying for me while I'm here. So, awesome. <laughs> well, he's he's gonna be very very proud. What what, um, what did Gateway do? And it's an amazing church. I know that they're phenomenal. What did they do in a practical way that that suddenly opened your heart where before you were closed? Like, wh- what in the world made you feel? No- how did you get normalized? What are the stages from I can't believe I'm walking through these doors to this is my church? And you know, how did that go for you? Um, well, for me, when I drove in, I. I Drove in, I wound up getting a U-Haul to leave from Las Vegas and um, drove 24 hours straight to Dallas. Slept for about two hours. My sister came in. She happened to be going to Gateway at that time. She said, hey, do you want to go to church with me? And I I said, God, you got me here. I'm going. (laughs) I'm going to see what you have me here for. And uh, I went, and of course, the service really moved me. Went down for prayer afterwards. Walked up to a woman, told her I was pregnant. She said, oh my gosh, we have a program that starts in two days. You got here just in time. So Really, it was just seeing God move. The only reason is because God opened my heart. Um, I mean, because I had not prayed or even thought about God in so long. And in Las Vegas, when, and maybe it was, you know, the pregnancy or whatnot, but God just really started pulling on my heartstrings. And I knew that who I was with wasn't right for me. The way I was living wasn't right. And then I needed to come home finally. And um, there's still a lot I'm walking out, like um, a lot of my family still doesn't really realize they don't want to ask because they really don't want to know what happened. Um, I was put on Channel 11 News during my trial. They paraded pictures of me from the internet and gave prices for how much I charged, and all my family saw that. And that was their first kind of, wait a second, what is she really doing? Um, So... Since then, they, they just really don't want to question it. So there's a lot of healing left to be done to walk out. But, but really, um, Gateway has been a paramount for me. And just the services that they've offered um, and the help that they've given me. They gave me a car. You know, they, they've done so many things for me. But um, not in the human trafficking awareness, necessarily. Just as restoration as a human being. Yes, sir. <laughs> Microphone. You touched on uh, your drug addiction, and that is, as we know, is so involved in all of this, whether it's the dancers, and it's very difficult to get out of this because of your addiction to the drugs. How did you even begin? Because there's actual the physical, the withdrawals, the detox, all of that. It's very difficult. Funny enough, for my situation, I did drugs, uh, you know, 15, 16, 17 years old. When I met this guy, he made me better because he wouldn't let me use drugs. So I was clean that entire 10 years with him. Didn't drink a sip of alcohol, didn't smoke a cigarette, didn't do anything because he wanted to take care of me. Really, he just wanted me keep me to stay as profitable as I could um, by not using drugs. So when I got out, when I ran from him and he was in prison, um, that's, I went right back to that 17-year-old girl that was doing the drugs, and that's when I got addicted to drugs I'd never even done before. And it was really hard without God or without any help. I was in a, a enabling relationship where that individual would have drugs for me waiting at home when I got home, even though I just had gone through a depression cycle of not ever wanting to do it again and hating myself. And then, bam, a week later, I'm doing it again. And, and I went on that vicious cycle for a while. And it took me removing myself from the situation finally to get away. Um, so my situation was a little different. Most girls, their traffickers feed them drugs, just like my boyfriend happened to. So uh, it can be really, really difficult, especially if if you're OK with it. And for me, doing the drugs, I always knew, like, I shouldn't be doing this. I don't want to be doing this. But then I would still do it, you know. But it, it would always come back to not wanting it. And finally, so I just, it just finally won out that I stopped. Yes. Ma'am, I would, uh, I'd like to observe that the courage that you're manifesting is incredible. Thank you. And I think that this speaks very loudly to me as a participant in the faith-based community that it would serve uh, everyone if we destigmatized people in that field, in that who are in that trap, if we destigmatized them in order to create a safe environment for them to expose themselves and uh, make a, uh, uh, an effort to escape once they know they're in a trap. Yes. Uh, I'm thinking that what you're doing 
is helping us make that kind of transition. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the society that we deal with has been stigmatized. That it's, it's, a, it's a worse sin to expose yourself than to be in that trap. Yes. And I want to thank you for your courage. And I'd like to make one more comment. It's not particularly about the escape that you're making, though. Mm -hmm. It is about an earlier part in this conference where it was revealed to us through statistics that a lot of the human trafficking is not sex related. A lot of it is people who want to hire servants and pay little prices for them and people who buy, get a bride and bring the bride over so that she can then be used as a slave or he can still be used as a slave. And I'd like to recommend to the faith-based community that we add our efforts to stigmatizing those people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The ones who create the demand for people that have been in the trap that you've been in, but also people who are creating another need for slavery, another marketplace for slavery, because they can do it and get away with it with no penalty or very little notice. Mm -hmm. So that's what I wanted to say. And thank you again for your courage. Thank you. I'll make him get his money's worth over here, running all the way. <laughs> you were at risk for a little while before you joined the industry. And if I, as a student, am worried that someone I know is at risk, how do I, as a peer, approach them and help keep them from joining the industry? There is literature out there, and um, first of all, you becoming educated so that, um, because like when I had heard, oh, what pimps were, and I thought, well, gosh, that's terrible. I definitely don't ever even want to meet a pimp, but that wasn't true education because it was just about two sentences, and it, it didn't teach me what they were really like or how they come to you and, and how it happens. So you have the possibility here, it sounds like, to be able to educate that young woman. There's, If you go to RebeccaBender.org, she has some phenomenal, it's spelled R-E-B-E-C-C-A-B-E-N-D-E-R.org. And that's actually my best friend. She was uh, trafficked with me. And um, she has some information that you can print out free of charge, like a red flag brochure, uh, the 40 uh, powers of coercion. And that's just some free things that you can even show her. And because we, we misidentify ourselves, and a lot of other people misidentify us too, but if you can get us to identify ourselves, that's where the transformation takes place. Because if you are telling me about something going on, but I don't see it applying to me, then it makes no difference at all. And you can't really just you can tell a person that they're a victim and what they're going through, but if they can read some literature and hear from other people or meet some NGOs, maybe suggest that you could go and um, volunteer at a place and be around and see what other people that are going through abuse, and, and that could maybe bring things to the surface for her, realize seeing patterns of the people that she's dealing with, or just the vulnerabilities, like, hey, uh, these are the vulnerabilities for sex trafficking, can you look at that? And then her thinking, wow, I fit the bill for every single one of those. That's kind of crazy. And maybe just that, even that self-awareness would help. We're going to do one more question. We're not going to wear out our welcome, but she can visit uh, with anybody right over here, if that's okay. Do you want to call it? Yeah. All right. Well, we're, we're going to give Claudia, who Delmar sponsored, the last question. Now, Claudia, don't foul this up. <laughs> no pressure. This is not a paid political announcement. <laughs> One of the most chilling things you've said is that prison was preferable to prostitution. Mm -hmm. At what point in your journey into this, the life, if I can use that without using it wrong, would you have heard that message and how do we get that out to the vulnerable in our community today? So are you asking me um, that prison was better? Or what, get that, what, well, you, you said you landed in prison. That was really kind of neat because it got you out of. Mm -hmm. So if I heard you right, 
prison was preferable to mm -hmm. prostitution. Mm -hmm. How do we get that message to the vulnerable who might be on a crossroads, and at what point in your tri trip through would you have listened to that and maybe paid attention to it? Well, just realizing that there are alternatives to the oppression, because when you're an oppressed people like that, you don't really think about how life might be in different situations, because all you can concentrate on is getting through that day, not doing anything to get beaten that day, you know, making a lot of money so that your trafficker will be happy with you that day. Um, <clears throat> so... I don't know that I would necessarily want to get the message that, that prison is better, but, but just uh, the getting something to them like, uh, you know, mass education where people see that what I'm doing is not normal. It's not the only way of life because that's really how it felt for those 10 years. It really did. I really felt like I could not leave. I had no idea. And I thought, I thought being normal would be so boring. I thought it would be terrible. I looked at you all as squares, and I did not want anything to do with you. You know, I thought you were all just out to judge me. And when I actually finally came out and realized the love that was out there and that being normal and going to bed at 10 o'clock is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you know, ha raising a son and, you know, that those things aren't boring. But it, it's just, it's slowly, it, it's just putting, putting something out there once, letting the, letting trafficked individuals get a little shimmer of hope that kind of, then it just slowly builds over time and then they hear something from someone else and it kind of connects with that piece until finally it grows strong enough where they have the courage to leave. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. stand over here so that we can Thank you very much, Rebecca. That was very, very good and insightful, and it sent the message of practicality, which we don't always hear. I'm not going to talk too long. I'm going to address your question and where we go from here, because I think our best time is to let you mingle and visit and to talk to Rebecca or talk to our faith-based folks or some of our law enforcements that are here. Henry, are you still here? Raise your hand in the back. I want everybody to know Lieutenant Henry Sepulveda is with our Corpus Christi Police Department, our Vice Investigations Division. Let me make some comments first to my faith-based groups here. Uh, Pastor Bill, thank you. Bay Area was part of this. Pastor David. Thank you. Rock City was part of this. My Catholic charity groups, you have all been there with me, even through the legislative session, and you are here with us today. Menta, I want you to know that New Life Ministries, you keep the fight going and keep that above like you're doing with the walks. It gets attention from er areas that don't necessarily see the attention. You keep that up. Driscoll Children's Hospital. It's interesting that they have taken a part and that they want to make sure that the word gets out. We had Dennis from Redeem Ministries who shared their vision. Marlene, Blue Nation, you cross from law enforcement with the faith-based groups. And we've also had Bear County Juvenile Justice Department. I want to thank you all because those groups have been involved in making this message come to you. So let's give them applause.
Let me get my administrative. I want to thank AEP. I want to thank Time Warner for being sponsors of the refreshments today. Let's give them a hand. And I want to thank Del Mar for providing this great facility. And I'm going to close on where we go from here, but I do want to note some of the folks that work with my office. So if you have questions, I, I keep pushing that. Talk to them. Sometimes you'll talk to me, but sometimes you want to talk to them. So let me tell you again who's here. Our coordinator, let's give her applause, Angie Flores in the back. And Jennifer, Jennifer Welch, right back here, who assisted Angie. Gay White, where's Gay? I guess she's out front. There she is. Dan Leyendecker was here earlier, but he had to leave. I have Charlotte Hutchinson, raise your hand. I also have our new, the microphone man himself, Mario right here and then as I've branded them the Dalton gang and Pruitt gang raise your hands right in here and no holiday you're still not on the team with that beard those are some of the folks that are here with me today they're with either my office on volunteering or they're here in a capacity so ask them and get involved now Let's answer the bottom line. Why are we here? Well, there's a lot. The first is we're here and we did this conference to explain to people it's real. You know, Rebecca was nice because she didn't explain about the cages where children were being treated as animals. You know, as a public official, I talked to a lot of folks, and they just don't believe this. Uh, it was kind of like the comments. You see it on movies, but you don't know it's real. And ladies and gentlemen, in the last three weeks, we've had two local areas that have had this happen in our backyard. So first, the message is reality. It is real. The second, the big theme, Educate and make people aware. Some people have never had an opportunity to see what was outside a prison, as Rebecca said. It's one of the few times I heard prison provided her the escape. But we have to make people aware. We have to educate. I go around the state. I am glad that I'm one of the few people that bring this up in the public office area. But people don't believe it. I get all the time, does that really happen? So that's the second, public awareness. Third, we have to draft laws that do not glorify the activity. I learned that from law enforcement. As you've heard, you've heard what a trafficker is, and you've heard pimp. You don't want to glorify in law the word pimp because it might actually have folks try to get charged with that. Now, you're going to say, well, aren't there prostitution laws on the books? Uh, aren't there slavery laws on the books? Well, there are, but sometimes the poor prosecutors, as James knows, he can't convict that person under those laws, especially if they fall under an international category. We have some prosecutors in the room here. They're doing a good job. Their problem is the state law sometime does not address what's happening in the activity. So sometimes they have to charge these folks. I think Rebecca told us a charge that she was given under not paying taxes or something. Well, that's a new one. Maybe we'll look at that. But... We have to draft a set of laws that apply today to what is going on. So, 
What has the legislature done? The legislature has started creating a database. That's good. We have to know the statistics. We have to know the areas, even though it's all over. Two, I'm not going to push that all laws fix this. I put a lot of faith in my faith-based groups and my law enforcement officials to handle some of this. Because let me tell you, ladies and, and gentlemen, because this is boys and girls that are in the human trafficking. A lot of times they don't want to prosecute yet, just like Rebecca has not pursued that. So I want them to feel that they can come to our faith-based groups and talk. And you're right, you brought that up. We've got to sometimes quit victimizing the people that have been abused. Let's quit stigmatizing them. Let's open up with arms. We're all human beings. So where do we go from here? Because you really don't have a comprehensive set of laws. I introduced, and I want you to take credit, and Blue Nation and my faith-based groups. I attended some of the meetings early on. I couldn't believe this either. I saw the movie Taken with my daughter, and that impacted me. I left it and thought, man, this is pretty Hollywood. I can't believe it. And then as some of you heard my story two months later, I found out I'm the chairman of the state of Texas that oversees civil prosecution of human trafficking. And I held a hearing, and I will tell you, Bill, David, I had Austin, San Antonio. See, they're calling me now. <laughs> I thought you were doing a reverse uh, deal on me here. <laughs> but I found out that there are not a lot of civil laws. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're all talking criminal law. Maybe we need to look at some civil punishment and civil fines in this arena as well. But when I found that out, it bothered me because I learned from law enforcement that a lot of milk curtains or we have children's faces saying that they're missing, they're really in this terrible situation. They're missing, they're in the trafficking. And we're not just talking Mexico, everybody. We're talking Eastern Europe. We're talking South America. We're talking Asia. We are talking United States. It has no region. So, I introduced legislation that in 2014 that the state legislature will finalize drafting the model human trafficking law for the state of Texas. Most people don't know that. I bet you didn't even know about that. The Coastal Bend is the author of that legislation. And the groups that I mentioned, and as Blue Nation, remember, I started with them. That gave me the emphasis and the impetus to do this. So where are we going to go from here? What we're going to do is, is in the beginning of next year, there will be a joint legislative uh, committee. There will be half senators, half state representatives. They will go through the state. They will take uh, testimony, and the plan is to turn into the legislature by the end of 14 a draft model Texas statute to stop human trafficking in the state of Texas and then it be used as a model for the rest of the United States. And I think that's the goal. And that's the plan. But I don't like to wait around. As my staff reminds me I'm sometimes impatient, much like the pastors that spoke today's programs. So what we're going to do is, is I'm taking our region today, and what we're going to do is we're going to create our own resource group that will draft what we want, and then I'm going to take that to the Joint Legislative Committee. So we are going to draft it from a practical standpoint. Now sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, what happens in South Texas doesn't necessarily apply, as Rebecca said, in North Texas. So what we're going to do is, is beginning in December, 
We are going to start our own anti-human trafficking workforce resource group. And the point is to draft legislation with a common sense viewpoint, not over where we can't reach anybody, but with a real point. And by that, I'm going to take it to the Joint Committee, since I authored the bill, <laughs> and we're going to try to make that part of the state laws of Texas. So that is the plan. <laughs> so, Angie Flores, raise your hand. And Jennifer, these are, Angie's the coordinator, Jennifer is assisting. Uh, if you're interested in being part of this, please give them your information before you leave or at least get their contact information. Uh, panelists and uh, prayer providers, unless you tell me otherwise, you're automatically on it, you're stuck. <laughs> so you do not have to stick because I will place you all on it. And then you can designate, if you can't be there, an alternate for you so that you're there but you are on the group. But if you're not on today's program and you want to be involved, I want you to make sure Angie, and if she's busy, Jennifer right over here, gets your contact information. And then we are going to go forward on this beginning in December. Because my view is why wait till January or February when the committee's formed, let's start to work now. Because if we start now, we may save lives. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for a great conference. I applaud you. Thank you very much.